So yesterday we had like a nice discussion. About Martians? On the <laughs> Among other things. Um, about like kind of what we want to get out of the class a little bit. So I've shifted certain things a little bit around. And we'll be kind of maybe like getting to more practical stuff a little earlier than I anticipated. Because I think that seems to be what's on the, on the agenda here. Um, so what, what we'll do today is um, I'll um, do kind of a, a, a short review of what we did yesterday because, you know, like everyone said, it was a lot to take in. And I think this repetition thing will sort of help us. Um, so I'll kind of like do a quick run through of the most salient points of uh, neural networks and convolutional neural networks, mostly focusing on what we should take away from it from, for now. And then later in like week three, we'll revisit it and um, maybe do it in a little bit more detail. And I think that's when people will have their sort of aha moments, you know, when we kind of, and hopefully between now and then I might make a few new materials, which will help that. Uh, but right now we can kind of like take, you know, get, take the gist of it and then proceed from there using it functionally. Uh, because with neural networks, we can kind of um, think of things in a very functional way. And so uh, I'll do a review, and then I'm going to introduce TSNI, which actually has nothing to do with neural networks by itself, but is uh, a nice thing that we can do practically uh, and one of our first practical applications. Um, yesterday, we, um, I guess, got pretty much everyone up and learning with sklearn. Raise your hand if you don't yet have sklearn working. Okay, cool. Scikit-learn. Um, so that's great. So everyone has that. Um, and the bad news is that uh, actually we might need to install more software <laughs> because um, I, so one of the things I did yesterday is I, I went home and I made an example that does everything straight through Python. Um, so now we have multiple ways of doing this. Um, the thing that I want to do today, which is uh, uh, using TSNI to visualize images um, by extracting a feature vector from each image using a covnet. And we can do that entirely through open frameworks. We have an example for that. I also now have an example that does it entirely through Python. However, it will require a little bit more software. Uh, so that may be something that we want to do in the afternoon. We can kind of do another one of these so uh, software setup sessions. I didn't anticipate trying to set up a lot of this deep learning software in the first week, but maybe it'll be kind of a good thing because if we all have it, we can like be doing things quickly and early and building tools as we go. So that might be worth doing, yeah. <laughs> um, some of the deep learning software can be a little tricky to install, um, but I think now that we kind of like got rid of some, like a lot of the bugs that we had to address yesterday, I think now that we've done those, hopefully it's a little easier to install. The thing that I mainly want to install is this library called Keras, which is a really excellent um, library that makes it much easier. It's basically a library that's built on top of TensorFlow or Theano. And TensorFlow and Theano are two well-known libraries that do, that do really like heavy lifting on the deep learning side. So making convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks and so on. And Keras is kind of a wrapper on top of it. So it is sort of like, let's say, the open frameworks of deep learning. It just gives you a lot of routines that do a lot of stuff really easily. And I was able to use Keras yesterday to make a simple, like, covnet to TSNI example. And we can maybe go through that, but it will require some more software setup, so maybe we can do that kind of in the afternoon. Um, and then before that, I'll talk about what TSNI is and show you some things that you can build with it so you can kind of get the juices flowing um, and getting some ideas. And also, I was thinking, I have also prepared a few, like, discussion materials that we can, that we can do, which may be also something good for the afternoon when we're all kind of feeling feeling full from lunch or whatever. Um, and um, one of the things I was thinking we could watch today is, um, is uh, Kate Crawford gave a recent talk at, at um, Republica about sort of, um, like a, it's a very sort of high level overview of ethics in, in uh, machine learning and AI. Um, and it's, it's quite good. And maybe we can, we can watch that. It's kind of, it's like an hour long. So uh, that might be, Maybe some something or part of an hour or something. Well, we we can talk about it anyway. Um, and then there's a few other things that I prepared along those same lines, like introducing some ethical uh, dilemmas. And one of those is is this, and I just kind of wanted to bring this up. I kind of like this quote. Um, so Marvin Minsky was um, 
one of the early pioneers in artificial intelligence. How many of you have heard the name Marvin Minsky? A few people. Uh, he, um, yeah, was a, just recently died actually, um, just a couple months ago. And he was an early pioneer in artificial intelligence in the 1950s and 60s and was kind of known for his very colorful personality, um, sort of this public intellectual who was very, um, you know, outspoken in various things about the science of AI. And um, this kind of, I think, like, uh, he's very pre-singularity, uh, but a lot of the singularity people really, like, idolize him um, in a strange sort of way. <laughs> Oh, I should yeah, I, should, I guess I should say, say this, and we'll talk about this this later. So, since the um, in the last like ten to twenty years, there's been a there's been this sort of um, like intellectual movement that that says that artificial intelligence is going to get to a point where it's smarter than human beings and more capable than human beings. And when that happens, when the first artificial intelligence happens that can basically self perpetuate itself, or make itself smarter and you know like an AI creating better AI and that AI creates a better AI will reach this singularity point in which very quickly all of like earthly life and everything will more or less be will go away somehow and and the whole world humanity will be taken over by robots and, and AIs and things like that um, and um, it's inspired a lot of debate one of the one of the first I guess one of the most prominent people in this camp is, is named Ray Kurzweil, who is uh, also like this sort of inventor in AI, and he has published a lot of books making predictions, like really wild predictions about what will happen in the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Um, I'm a bit of an AI, uh, or I'm a bit of a singularity skeptic. I think it's kind of a big industry these days, and there's a lot of like, there's a lot of, um, it's very big sort of hype market um, attached to AI, and I think it leads to a lot of misleading things. But um, you know, for in it's very prominent in the AI world, so maybe we'll talk about it at some point later. Um, Ray Kurzweil is a bit of a clown, actually. But anyway, um, but Marvin Minsky, uh, we we all kind of like Marvin Minsky because early AI pioneer, and he and he has this quote that I like. So, will robots inherit the Earth? Yes, but they will be our children, right? Which is which kind of begs to ask, like, why are we so afraid of you know the singularity or AI, you know, that overtakes humanity? Like, if we, if in the future robots, uh, you know, are robots eliminate human beings, not violently, let's say, but just like <laughs> the you know in the future, if if humanity is overtaken by robots, is that some like what is the reason we should be afraid of that? Are they you know, are, are, what is it about human beings that we, that we find so much so superior to, to sort of robots and, you know, that all we are, we're carbon-based life forms. What is it that's so special about carbon? So... What's the question? The, the chief runs on who? You know? Like, uh, who is responsible for producing those children and uh, what it means? What is the end? I mean, we shouldn't also forget that part because it's like a nice story when it looks like that, you know? But, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it has to be from politicized. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you mean that, like, if... Who, who, who has the tools to produce those children? Uh, okay. And uh, what it means in terms of the legacy? Mm -hmm. Anybody, anyone else have some thoughts? I like the idea of, like, robots being these amazing, like, the best lovers ever, you know, like, fuck these humans, the robots, <laughs> like, you know, that, like, they kind of, like, do all those things, and maybe they don't talk quite too much, and they're like, do you know, right? That's right. And then, and then, and then you have sex with them, and then he makes his little robot babies. And then his little <laughs> robot comes out, and he's like all electrical, and like, ah! I, I, <laughs> <laughs> that would be kind of cool. Actually, I saw a video the other day of like, they, they use like a mechatronic baby in, in, to make, you know, like fake babies in movies and stuff, and they show it without its skin, and it's like a tiny robot baby, and it's oh, kind of gross it's looking. Yeah. <laughs> we should put them on the screen, maybe. I should have, I should have, you know what, that would be a great graphic for this slide. I'm going to have to remember to put that there. Oh, I got to, I got to write that down, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> robot baby. Um, okay. <laughs> so, um... Okay, so let's do a quick review right after I write down this note to make a robot baby slide. Um, <laughs> uh, 
so the next thing we'll do is do a quick review of the things that we did yesterday and, and sort of introducing neural networks and, I'm, and just to take the sort of most salient parts of them, right? So the core unit of a neural network is a, is a neuron or, um, or a unit. It carries a value, which is a weighted sum of other values. So other neurons send value, send data into the next layer of neurons. And the more the weight, the higher the weight is in the connection between neurons, then the more influence that, that you know, say in this case, X1 has on, this, on the next neuron. And then, um, and we will set them up in an architecture like this. So this, and uh, you know, a neural network may have any number of hidden layers between inputs and outputs. And we do a forward pass by putting in um, values at the beginning, and then then propagating them through the network by multiplying them by their weights, summing them together, passing them through an activation function, which is usually a what's called a, a ReLU unit. Rectified linear unit, which just takes the, which just um, bottoms it out at zero. That's all. It's called a rectified linear unit, um, ReLU, so R E L L U, um, and um, that's kind of yeah. But actually, I was thinking that too. Because I don't know if you already have one, but basically like a little kind of cluster or something. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah, a glossary might be might be useful. So let me just review. Like I'll do that. After I mean, today. Maybe even in some of the yeah, yeah, a glossary might be nice. Uh, maybe in a hackpad. So, like, we've introduced a few terms so far, right? Uh, we've talked about, um, like, a, a neural network, artificial neurons. Those we use so much that they probably don't need to be put in, in the glossary, I suppose. But, like, a forward propagation or a forward pass means uh, putting data into the input and then propagating it forward through the network. So go through these multiplications until you get values on the other side. Um, that's forward propagation. Backward propagation is, it, it's kind of, um, because we haven't talked too much about how training works, and we, we will we'll maybe do that later in the course, it may not make sense why it's called backward propagation, but it kind of refers to the technique that's used to solve neural networks. So neural networks have to be solved, right, in the sense that we have these weights and our task in training the neural network is to find the correct weights. And by the correct weights, I mean the weights that give us the results we desire. So it's able to do the prediction reasonably well or accurately or um, lots of other tasks that we saw that neural networks are doing. It's, it boils down to finding the correct set of Ws, which is not a trivial thing. It may be easy looking at a neural network like this, but in you know, actual neural networks that we use in practice, they can have millions and millions uh, of connections. Um, actually, the l last year's, um, or was it this year? <laughs> uh, the winner of the ImageNet competition, this is an annual competition to create the best, uh, uh, in computer vision, it's an annual competition to create the best system which um, is able to classify images correctly from the data set image, ImageNet, which has millions of images in a thousand classes. The most recent winner was a convolutional neural network with 150 layers, 152 layers, I think. So these things be, are becoming increasingly deep, and that's what we mean by deep, deep learning. It has many, many layers of, of typically neurons in neural networks, Deep learning doesn't exclusively refer to neural networks, but it's mostly associated with them as of now. Anyway. So wait, I forgot. So each layer has its own weights? Each of the connections between layers have weights. So like all those lines have, have weights. Yep. Um, and so yeah, this is a forward pass. The layers of neural network, is there an equivalent in the brain? I'm not the best person to ask this, but I've been told that the visual cortex, I think, has some, uh, it can be, yeah, ha has some sort of a layering kind of structure. And, um, but otherwise, the brain is kind of messy. Um, and we don't know as much about it as we do about these, which we invented entirely. Um, so maybe, maybe some. Um, it's worth looking into, actually, um, parallels between neuroscience and the, and the brain. Actually, recently there was a cool um, paper. Someone wrote a paper 
uh, about can we use um, what was it like it was trying to evaluate neuroscience using using techniques from computer science what uh, I have to look this up uh, it's a cool paper I'll look it up later um, it's just from a few weeks ago I was reminded of it um, so a concrete task in for neural networks is classifying images like images of handwritten digits and this is a very typical like when you first start to use some of these neural network frameworks this will be like the first example that you learn uh, so an image is really nothing but a collection of pixel values pixel intensities so we can interpret we can take these and make them the input layer to a neural network and oops, I guess I didn't include the rest of the, I shouldn't include the slide, but um, actually, I guess I can end this forward pass. What's the, I forgot what it was called, forward, ah, yeah, okay, this is not very big, but the idea is we might set up a neural network for classifying digits like this, and so we get this image of a two, it goes through the network, it has some number of hidden layers, let's say, and we hope that it gives us a performance like this, where the neuron associated with a 2 gives us the highest value. And again, it won't, like we, it won't do that immediately, but by setting up these weights, uh, by finding a good set of weights, it will behave that way. It will give us the correct answers. And finding the correct weights is not trivial, because, like I said, there's very many of them and they have to be set at the same time. You can't evaluate them one at a time because they're very interdependent, right? So the value of the two neuron is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a function of literally all of these connections in the first layer before it because all of these, um, you can see that there's a path between every, every pixel and every hidden layer into the two neuron. So uh, they're highly interdependent and so they're, they're tricky to solve and it's taken, taken decades of research into uh, in computer science to find ways of, of, of solving them and now we have these libraries that do it very well for us uh, essentially and it's really useful to understand how it works and we'll maybe like devote a bit of time to doing that to some extent this is the most easily black boxable aspect of neural networks that we can uh, that you know that we can attack put a black box around because we're really right now more interested in understanding what they do uh, not how they're not how they're formulated, but what they do. However, it's it's certainly very helpful to understand how they're trained. So maybe we'll spend some time looking at that later. Uh, but in general, the way they're trained is using what's called back propagation, using a method called stochastic gradient descent. And what that means, um, I'll explain later. But it's kind of this iterative procedure where at, at we take an example, we observe the error and we correct the error by just a little bit by adjusting all of the weights, all of the weights by just a little bit. And it turns out we can do this very elegantly using, using, like, uh, using some calculus um, and computer science. And, uh, and increasingly there, there are more complications added on top of that, but that's really the basic thing. And we'll maybe talk about this because it's actually super general also. Gradient descent is used to solve any sort of multivariable function um, and, is, and is very prominent in lots of other things besides for just neural networks and machine learning. Just a quick question. Yep. The value of each weight, is it that's always between 0 and 1? Uh, no. Uh, they can be, in theory, they can be anything. Okay. Uh, they're, they're unbounded. But what usually, but the thing is, like, uh, do a thought experiment. Imagine we have a set of weights and we multiply all of the weights by 100 or something or 1,000. Relatively. Yeah, really, it's the relative, the relatively speaking, like how they relate to each other that's important. So typically, they end up being sort of small positive and negative numbers. Uh, okay. But it, yeah, but it doesn't really for us matter too much what those actual values are for now. Um, it and it, there are various sort of minutia that are you know in the in the field that research scientists have to deal with, but we won't um, we won't talk about them too much in this course. All right, so we talked a little bit about the big picture. So we, we looked at really one specific application, which is classifying handwritten digits and finding a label for them. And that's, that's very much like this first use case, which is prediction, right? So you get some data set and you want to predict 
uh, something about it. And that can be either in the form of classification or regression. Classification means we have a bunch of categories and all of the data points belong to a category and we want to be able to predict what category that is. So another example of that is, is my email spam or not? Is this number, uh, which of these, which digit is this image of a number? Um, all of the image classification stuff is, a, is another example of classification. So is this image of a cat or a dog? So all of those. And those are sort of the most typical uses of machine learning, or sorry, of neural networks. Um, another one that we'll kind of talk about, um, and I'll, I'll, we won't really talk about it too much today, but I'll show, I'll, I'll, I have a couple slides just to introduce it, is this notion of like um, turning low value information into high value information, which is sort of a, what unsupervised learning is all about, which means that we don't really, we're not, it's not so much labels that we're trying to find, it's, we're trying to find structure. So we're trying to organize data somehow because it, it's useful for us. And um, we often want low dimensional data of a higher quality uh, because that's much more computable and, and useful for various tasks. And so that's something that we also use neural networks to do. So what's mm -hmm. this low value information? Like what is... So low value information would be like pixels. You get an image and all the data that you have about it is just pixels. And every pixel itself, by itself, it has very, carries very little information that's useful for us. Like if you know what the 700th pixel in that image is, does that tell you anything about the image? Right? It's really about what the, what the pixels together mean. And so we're trying to find structure, kind of. Um, and that's kind of what, what neural networks are also very useful for doing. And then in the more media art context, we're interested in creating mappings between different kinds of information. So a lot of times in, in typical new media art and interactive art, we're getting some sensory data. So like we have a camera or we have a microphone or, you know, all the things that we're probably pretty used to in, in, this, in this kind of a environment. And we want to create actions corresponding to those inputs. Um, so, and we, and we, so we can kind of create our own data sets and create a function which maps from one to another effectively. Uh, and in doing so, we can create really interesting correspondences, nonlinear correspondences between different kinds of inputs and outputs. Something like that. Hand wavy. <laughs> um, and then more complex, I'll talk about this stuff later. Um, and they're, they're all kind of related somehow. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, this was, this was um, just the last thing we talked about was, so an example of that is we get connect data or elite motion data or face tracker and we map those uh, inputs in real time to actions. So turning, twisting the knobs in our, in our sound and uh, visual creating devices. And um, this is going to be something that we do a lot of next week, especially because Weconator is excellent for doing this. Um, using some of the software that we're all, like, what, what's really nice about Weconator and why um, it's a great part of this course is that it lets us attach machine learning to some of the things that we're already using. So some of you guys are maybe already using processing or maybe already making music with various music making software and we'll be able to control those things with Weconator. Uh, and then attach things like connect and leap motion and they'll all be sort of like Lego blocks that we can attach to each other and play with. Um, so yeah. the fun begins next week? Sorry? So the fun's beginning next week. So the fun begins... Or you all prepare yourself. <laughs> fun is beginning next week. Fun is beginning next week. Uh, the fun will begin today uh, or, or yesterday, who knows. Um, aren't we all having fun? <laughs> so... Uh, we need to make some innovations to simple neural networks to make them perform better um, because images of cats are not as, as predictable as images of sevens and eights. So when we are classifying handwritten digits, we don't think that the six can appear backwards, right? We're not trying to make a system that sees sixes that are backwards. But cats can be looking in different directions or be outstretched and so on. And so uh, we need to, and this is kind of the motivation behind convolutional neural networks, which are very similar to neural networks, but um, 
and they're very prominent all over and, and kind of like you almost never see in at least in research and industrial applications, neural, ordinary neural networks are by now like not used so much. So like self-driving cars and things like that, they can't just use simple neural networks. They need a lot more sophistication and a lot better uh, vision. Um, and computer vision has been mostly overtaken by con convolutional neural networks, and uh, and actually that that continues to uh, that continues to actually grow its influence in in various domains. Would uh, a self-driving car would they have a component in in the car, or would that be so they all like all the cars have their own individual neural networks as well as like mm -hmm. the reaching algorithm and the server. Yeah, there's all sorts of layers of complexity. So certainly all of them need to be able to see the road. So they'll have computer vision systems, which are typically being sort of um, driven by convolutional neural networks. And then, yeah, there's this whole routing and, 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 uh, and, and actually like one of the funny things, of the ironic thing about self-driving cars is that they probably can, can already work if all the cars on the road were self-driving cars. <laughs> Because it's self-driving cars that can negotiate with each other, and, and, and they're probably all very predictable if they're using a similar system. Um, but but right now, that's sort of hard to implement. I think it seems like it seems very likely that um, in the very near future, maybe in the next decade, you'll see things like truck driving um, being totally mechanized. Well, the thing, the reason why, um, the reason why this may happen is that it's being shown that they're they're probably even now better drivers than the humans dri driving them. So there's all sorts of like really crazy stuff about truck driving. People who drive trucks, this is a problem not just with, I mean, this is a labor problem also. Like truck drivers have these crazy like 36 hour shifts, and you know there's a big problem of of people getting tired on the road and exhausted, and and also the t kind of driving they do. You know, it's like one really long straight road. And so it may be the case that robots are safer at, at driving those trucks. So it's not, the, you know, it's not that it has to be demonstrated that robots are 100% safe. It's that they're safer than the humans uh, driving them. And this presents a moral dilemma, right? Because these, these are truck drivers. It's a big um, workforce. You know, what do they, what do, they do? Uh, well, we can say about the taxi drivers now. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. But also, I mean, so... I think the, the way that I would imagine the problem would, could be is like the um, a lot of proprietary things. So like you know self self driving cars that kind of like don't have the same rules because otherwise one company would have to own all of the things and say you have to implement this in all of them. But of course it's not going to be that way. So then there's going to be a lot of different companies and the rules are going to be all like mm -hmm. knows. And then we're kind of screwed. I don't know. Kind of scary. No, it's very true, and there's a big cascade of, of problems that, that are, we're not really prepared to deal with. So, so yeah, these sort of monopolistic uh, practices, like the, this, can, this is also going to be something that we have to confront. And we're already seeing that with, as you said, taxi drivers, right? So, so now we have like a small number of monopolies, maybe just one, uh, <laughs> with the German name of all things, um, is, is overtaking the taxi market. And you know that presents all sorts of problems. Um, there's a lot of good writing I could recommend about 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 those guys. But but with truck driving, yeah, it's probably going to be the same thing. And and you know a lot of people will need to ha get other jobs. And how do we how do we help them? Uh, or they should all just become machine learning. <laughs> it's too big of a discussion to to it even. It's the human error thing. Self-driving cars. I mean, it would be amazing if like everyone could just switch to self-driving. And it just removes all human error. That, that, like what you were saying, the danger of there being both on the roads. But I guess when it's all self-driving cars, isn't that danger for pedestrians? Yeah. But I guess all their senses maybe are so good. But I still feel trolley like question. Or this is a this is a really great variant of the trolley question. So like yeah. when self-driving cars can evaluate wh who to hit, if they you know if you have to hit yeah. one pedestrian or the other, how does it decide? Yeah. Maybe it, it quickly scans their social media and tries to evaluate how useful to society yeah. they are. So I mean I know that sounds really dark and I'm laughing about it, but it's it's super real, like and, and something we have to think about. Yeah. And it's where it's where it mentioned um, this is it's known I, I don't know very much about this, but there's been a few articles that like 
Um, China is rolling out this program to, to sort of, there's like a citizen score. Um, you know, it's almost like our credit score, let's say, in, 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 in America, we have a like credit score. I guess we have it in Europe too. Um, and this one is like more general and it's super Orwellian, Orwellian sounding, right? So uh, something that we're going to need to scrutinize a lot and, and see. Um, apparently, it's not as scary as it sounds. There was a lot of like hysteria over it. And it turns out that it's kind of maybe limited to certain use cases, but I don't know. It's pretty. It's pretty weird. Right? <laughs> oh, is so in? Uh, is this really just in, in America? No, like ba banks attach a score to you. Yeah, it's like your credit. Yeah, like your how credit, uh, like how credit worthy are you? Um, you know, will you be given a credit card or so on? And and I actually I think credit scores might be sort of going on the way out because nowadays like we have such better ways of evaluating someone's trustworthiness that I wonder if credit scores are sort of on the way out. That's ridiculous, like you have to start using a credit card to get a credit score. So I know people who like aren't allowed to rent a house unless they have a credit rating. Yeah. They can't get that unless they start using a credit card, which they wouldn't have done anyway, so like technically right. 100%. I mean, just, one of the, just one of the many, many things that, that financial institutions do that doesn't make a lot of sense. I guess. So, <laughs> oh no, 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 no! This is like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure people are working on on that, but but um, oh well. But convolutional neural networks are analyzing your social media. So every time you post a photo on Facebook, uh, it's able to figure out who's in it. And, and to some degree, it's able to figure out people who aren't even on Facebook. So you don't even have to have a Facebook account. If you appear in a picture in Facebook or in multiple pictures, they can triangulate those together and, and potentially even figure out your identity because if you're connected to a certain group of social, like a social graph, and um, it's able, you're, you're, I mean, this is a hard problem, but it's very much practical and, and something that we can expect that like face, Facebook and other social media services, they know a lot about people who aren't on Facebook. Um, and this is kind of the, this like is very interesting. the government starts insisting that Facebook or Apple give them that information. Yeah, or uh, even more cynically, you could say that Facebook and Google are, are, are becoming a new form of government in some, in some sense of the word. Yeah. In Europe, they're not allowed to do anything. They're already being bought to stop. Yeah, I think there are more restrictions in Europe, yeah. And besides that also, uh, I think Google is still doing, but Facebook was also tracking users across websites as well, even while they weren't a member of Facebook, they were also in the world and stuff. Yeah. So they're doing some counter movement at the same yeah. time, which is a good thing, but also sort of signifies yeah. that it's important to think about it, because even 60-year-old politicians are thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. And it's true that, that there's more restrictions in Europe, and I think part of the part of the motivation of European governments for that is that these companies are in America, so like American companies are collecting data about about Americans and Europeans. And in general, it is, but um, in this case, it's, it's coming from the privacy departments of the governments that use uh, yeah. the old rules that are already there. For the thing that's the way that people get away with it or something is like with the uh, like the network. Lines that they, you know, like because, like, like, for example, with email, how they like bounce from country to country. So, like, yeah, they can't track you here, but as soon as the, the, the connection goes to another country that can track, then they, so there's like still, they're, they're yeah, I mean, I, I'm not really so familiar with the topic, but I read an article that a lot of it is really just protectionism from Europe because they actually want to kind of grow the tech community here. Um, so, any company from the US is not trustworthy. <laughs> no, no, that was, that was excellent. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, this is sort of like with Cubnets, we kind of have this volume interpretation that we're moving volumes of data through the layers. So the first volume is the image, which has multiple channels, 
and then it creates a volume of convolutions. Like using convolutions, we create this volume of like the responses, which we stack together, and then move through more convolutions. And and and, and like the the maybe like the point for point multiplications, you can kind of ignore for now or black box, and we'll we'll review those more carefully later. But the main gist of it is that every time we pass this um, pass this volume through a layer. We have this like big volume of like it's almost think of it like voxels or you know pixels but in 3D, and all of those pixels are contain maybe in some probabilistic sense like uh, an interpretation of how much of this feature is present in the original image at that point, um, and so this is like this volume of high level data, and at every layer it becomes more abstract. And in becoming more abstract, it's doing this thing that we mentioned in the, in the previous slide, that it's creating sort of like encoding low-level information, like, you know, pixels and whatever, into high-level information, presence of ears and wheels and speakers and whatever, things like that. Uh, and that's kind of what's happening inside of a convolutional neural network, inside of a neural network in general, but especially with, with cut nets. And um, we talked about how convolution is done, which is this process of taking these convolutional filters, which is a set of weights. And it's just like it was before, except now the weights are not the whole size of the image, or the filters are not the whole size of the image. They're like a small, and you scan them across looking for these small features, and then you combine them. This is the whole stacking thing. And just one question. Yeah. Then the filter we are seeing right now is just one filter among a lot of filters. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. and In a particular layer. As we saw yesterday at some point. Mm -hmm. And uh, the filter is 5 by 5 matrix. Uh, what it means? It means that every, uh, at every step, it uh, applies a transformation to a huge matrix or to only one pixel. So it, it'll it'll see this green box sliding across. It's the same size as the filter, yeah. and we take them and we we dot product them. So you have you have basically twenty five multiplications that get added together and become one pixel here. Okay, so it's an array of similarity. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's like similarity to get a high score. It's very similar. Yes. Score, right. Yeah. Exactly. So so the filters are sort of like. They're looking for a pattern that's that's sympathetic to it. That's not the pooling. Yeah, the pooling is the pooling is. Uh, I have a slide on pooling. I think. Um, hang on. Oh, I don't didn't include it here. Pooling is just downsampling, so that's another layer. Um, and there's no weights in that. That's just compressing the information. That's what I was going to ask you quickly about the um, the volume image that you had before. Mm -hmm. So the depth is the channels in the first case, and then mm -hmm. it's timed by the convolutions. Mm -hmm. But then the fact that the scale of the image is getting smaller, is that recording? Mm -hmm. and the, the fact they were getting like thinner and longer? Yeah, uh, oh, and well, this diagram. image is just like, this image is just an example, but typically, but the yeah, they... getting smaller in X and Y. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that recording? Uh, yeah, that's pooling, and it can be done in other ways. So there's uh, certain things about convolutions that we haven't mentioned that you can like maybe skip. You don't have to do it every row, but you can. There's there's a parameter called stride where you can maybe like skip. That also helps, and some people want to replace pooling with just strides uh, of more than one. There's uh, but but basically pooling is what's compressing the x and y. Yeah, for the most part. Um, uh, this is what a set of convolutional layers looks like. Uh, I showed the demo earlier today, and, and now actually this is working now, so we can actually look at this. Um, so, demos. Yeah, it's a little Google Earth plugin. It's kind of nice. Okay, so check this out. Um, we're going to look at a what's called a confusion matrix. I hope this is working. <laughs> this is, yeah, I think it's working. Yes, hooray, all right. So, and this is online so you can see it. So what we're, what we're looking at is, this is a convolutional neural network running live, classifying digits from CIFAR 10. So the cats and dogs, and, and I'll explain every part of this. Um, it's classifying images of dogs and cats and, and deer and automobiles and ships and so on. As it does it, oh, did I stop it? Did I start over? 
Okay, let's try it again. Uh, okay, so as it goes, you see like, it's just, it's replacing, these are all, and in green it's correct, so like, they were going really fast, so I just want to mention, but if it's green, it means that it correctly classified that image, and if it's red, it says what it classified it and, and what it actually is. And then over here, this is what's called a confusion matrix. So the confusion... Yeah, here, while well, it's stopped here, I'll, I'll, I'll show you what the confusion matrix shows us. So it shows us a breakdown of all of the classifications, and the rows are what the image actually is. So the rows are, these are actual airplanes, actual automobiles, actual birds, and so on, and the columns are what the, the network predicted. So the diagonal is all the correct ones, right? So these are airplanes that were correctly classified as airplanes, and they're sorted by the confidence. So you can see that in this subset here, these are all the best airplanes. Air airplanes that were correctly classified with confidence that they're airplanes. And you can see that a lot of them are like very, very typical airplanes, right? These are typical airplanes, like really good automobiles, birds, you know, cats and so on, Do deer, dogs. Um, now we can look at the mistakes it made. So for example, you know, f um, cats that look to it like dogs. So these were, the network thought these were dogs, but they're actually cats. You can see in the images they're cats, but the network thought they were dogs. <laughs> um, and these are cats that look like ships. I guess. <laughs> so, so it's confusing the most actual faults with cats. Yeah. Oh, here's so, and these are the best mistakes, right? So, like, so, like, let's look at a deer, deer that's look, classified as birds. So you see the top one here. That's a deer that was misclassified as a bird, and you can kind of see why, right? Like, like it looks you, those. You can see why it might have confused the antlers for wings. I think. Can you go to the frog cats? Why are there some mistakes there? Frog cats. Let's see. Frog cats. <laughs> I think actually the thing about the frogs is that it has a really bad accurate. There's lots of mistakes in frogs. So some of the classes are more predictable than others. And you can see that the recall, this is the percentage accuracy on the actual samples. So like it's really easy to do airplanes. And it's really easy to do ships because I think because of the sky, this sort of makes it obvious. But then some of these like like birds are really difficult. So there's a lot of bird cats. <laughs> um, yeah, there's just confusing features, like features that appear in both. Some overlap. But how can like I never mentioned what like intentions, for example, in some kind of class? Uh, if you had like, an image of a person playing volleyball and a person playing soccer, mm -hmm. um, like, there's a ball, there's a person, I can distinguish these two things. Um, I'm thinking about. How can you distinguish the things inside of the image? Yeah, can you, how can you say that this person is playing, like, for example, the voice, the picture was going down, and um, I think maybe it's this a, like, the intention is the well, yeah, there are, there are lots of, but this is just an example that's not very good, but there are lots of cases in which uh, the distinctions are not, not really possible, but still are you, like, a human person can, can make it. Uh, so how can you... About intentions, because, like, for example, uh, like, if you, if you see the position of the person, how loud is it going, which direction is going, so all those kinds of things are not being done very well right now. Um, so, so what you mentioned is a very hard problem. So determining like what's happening in an image is stuff that there is research into, but but is currently not very good. Uh, I mean, you know, the, we have and there are ways of doing it. So um, in terms of like multiple things inside of an image. So let's say some, a person playing volleyball. Well, we have lots of pictures of people. We have lots of pictures of volleyballs. 
And so it, it, we can detect those things individually and reason that there's maybe some, you know, person playing volleyball. And some of the, these, there's like captioning libraries, and I showed those, I think I showed those briefly. If we, if I haven't, I'll show them later. Um, but like there are ways of kind of inferring multiple things inside of an image, but then creating correspondences like over time uh, is something uh, that we're not doing very well right now. So these systems are pretty dumb right now in, in, those, in that sense. Um, so, so yeah. So right now we're just doing image, I mean, single images, but like how do people then say do one image and then one before and one after? Like then you'd have a better sense, but like they don't do that, right? They just do one. There is some work on like video classification. Uh, so, you know, multiple images. Uh, and and it, it can be done. It's just it's just a hard problem. So right now our existing systems are pretty raw. So but definitely an area of active research. Um, do people use sci-fi one hundred as well? So let's stick it up. Yeah, I'm sure. Are they all less accurate? Well, certainly. Uh, well, no. There's, there's. I think just as many, if not more, images. Uh, but uh, no, there's more images. But, but, um, but it's, it's hard because now there's a hundred classes, so there's a lot more sources of confusion. Um, and actually, like, um, there's a. I think it's six hundred images per class, close to six thousand images per class in that one. Oh, maybe yeah. So we have fewer, sure. Uh, but 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 that's still 600 times 100. So there's more yeah. more images in general, and that actually does help. Like you may have less images of each class, but having more images overall, because a lot of the features overlap. So there's actually like, um, but it, it's just harder because now a random guess has a one percent chance. Here we have a ten percent chance doing random random guesses, and with CIFAR 100, uh, the data set that 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 Jake mentioned is. Um, CIFAR 100, which is, there's two varieties of this data set. One has 10 classes, one has 100 classes. Obviously, it's harder to do 100 class classification. And I think our, I forget what the current top accuracy is. It's like, it's pretty high. I think it's like 60% top one guess or something. I forgot. And then CIFAR 10, it's like 96%. Recently, it was broken, actually. So this is, this right here, I have 57% in the browser, and I think actually I have this wrong, like this this actual library I think can do close to 80% maybe, and then the current record holder in the research, like which is a deep, like a deep convolutional neural network, gets 96% accuracy on CIFAR 10. So 96% in the first, in top guess. And I think for CIFAR 100 it's like 60%. Which is still pretty impressive. So one out of a hundred. No, 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 no. Uh, this is uh, this is using a library called Covnet.js, which is a JavaScript convolutional neural network library uh, made by made by this guy Andre Karpathy, who um, you'll be seeing some of his work later. Also, he's also a researcher, very active in the field. Um, and we, I also have this for numbers, the digits. This is much more accurate. So we can look at some of these. So these are two misclassified as a nine. You can kind of see why, right? It's convincing. Two misclassified as a four. Eight misclassified as a two. You can see the eight in the, like, the top of the state. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the top ones here. They kind of look like one. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Some of them, some of them are. You can be sympathetic to the errors, um, and actually, there's a few errors that are just the wrong label in the data set um, that was labeled wrong. So humans make mistakes too, um, which is kind of yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> is, is that a passive system, or is that helping in correcting or tuning the algorithm? Oh, sorry, sorry. What's that? What we are seeing right now. You're seeing it's already been trained, and this is its performance. So it's not like an active uh, optimization of the training? No, it's already been trained. We're just seeing it tested on new samples, yeah. and we're seeing how accurate it is. And could we imagine that this process is used for optimizing the training? Well, the, well this is how training... Sure, training also takes in numbers, but this, is, this right here is just like after it's been trained. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you say 
finish training and you still have some some big heat states, you like the, the idea is that you you need to go deeper and create new layers to like or you go deeper and more of course you have. Is it something like that? At a certain point um it doesn't help necessarily to have you know like some really good networks have ten layers, some have hundred layers. So it, it's kind of like it's architecture is a architecture is a big area of research and it's not always obvious like what makes sense to make very big layers or very deep layers. And, yeah. If this one's already been trained, does that mean that we'll make the same mistakes every time? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Neural network once it's been trained is deterministic. So there's some set of weights and it'll give you the same answer every time. Mm -hmm. okay. I thought you were saying for this Was that with the deep uh, Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's different. Yeah, yeah, those are there. Like we're using a, a neural network, but it's part of a bigger process, uh, which has this sort of stochastic optimization thing going on. Um, so that's that's something different. Okay, let's go back to the slides. Uh, we looked at some yesterday. We looked at some um, experiments to try to get inside of these things and understand what what they're seeing, and, and we looked at like um, parts of images that maximally activate certain neurons. So some, Im some neurons are looking for lattices, some are looking for weird sort of, almost looks like crop circles or something, or, or just circles in general. Uh, I do, it, it appears in the paper, and the paper is at this link. I just don't have it in the slide. So yeah, it, it does, uh, it does have, the thing is though that, um, here's the problem with visualizing the filters, it only makes sense to us at the first layer. Because once we go deeper, now it's filters upon filters upon filters, and so they won't necessarily, like, you won't necessarily detect a pattern or something. Um, it, it, at the first layer, the patterns will look exactly like the things they're finding. But at the next at the next few layers, that becomes more abstract, and so the patterns won't necessarily like resemble anything like this. Like we don't have a, like a lattice filter looking thing. Uh, could, could you shortly explain that again that the filter system how they're stacked on top of each other? Is it kind of like a stack and they interact? They get information from each other as well. So is there some relationship between the filters? Well, the filter the filters themselves, like those little weight sets, they're individual and they get applied to the volume at that layer. And then we take all of those responses and we stack them together into a new volume and then proceed through the network. But they're not in any relationship to each other. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry? They're not in any relationship to each other. What do you mean by relationship to each other? They get some sort of um, information about this happening in this filter, so you have to reapply that filter. Well, at successive layers, I suppose, in some sense, you know, they're, they're getting information from previous layers, but all the ones in a single layer, they all act independently on, on the volume, and then they're added together. And actually, there's a lot of work shown that sometimes you have redundant filters and, and things like that. That, that. that can happen, I think. So they're not dynamic? Well, they're, dyna they're dynamic, but, um, but maybe they're redundant. And actually, I know that like in our genes, like we have redundant genes too. Apparently, there's a lot of like useless genes in our in our DNA. That sounds so funny because your name is Gene. Like, it's like a... I've I've never gotten that before. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yes, redundant gene. Um, oh, that's an I. Actually, I never noticed this. That look, I guess that's an I. Is that an I? Looks like an I. Look how good we are at noticing, you know, like all of these things, you see that these aren't eyes, but this appears to be an eye. We humans are so capable. Um, we talked, to, we started to, we kind of introduced Deep Dream and class visualization, which is inverting the problem. So now instead of uh, showing what activations come from what images, we ask what images would produce some activations. So what images would make the neural network go, this is definitely a brambling, or this is definitely a set of swimming trunks, <laughs> or a barn? Well, a little too close. Candles. And the cool thing about this, they've also shown, like, you can do all this sort of generative arithmetic on these. So they can, like, attach, they can generate new images that have the flame on top of it. 
Um, and actually, we'll see we'll see a case of this later like in the slides. Sorry. You can sort of composite generative features, something like that, um, in in synthesizing these. Uh, we talked about style transfer, which is this technique of recomposing one image in the style of another. And like Deep Dream, it's it's a sort of stochastic iterative process. And st stochastic, um, stochastic means basically it's random, pseudo, so somewhat random, in the sense that it won't generate the same image every time. Uh, and it's iterative because, as you can see, it proceeds in like steps. We adjust the pixels little by little until the features emerge out of it. So it's a sort of like thing where the pixels are kind of negotiating with each other, like how to make the image you know, appear the way it does. Uh, and then, again, when we cover style transfer more carefully, I'll explain what all of the, all of the math is. It turns out the style transfer like follows very naturally from the uh, like understanding CubeNet activations, but we, we'll kind of leave that more carefully for another day. Uh, but the main gist of it is that if we observe their activations, the responses from the convolutional filters, uh, the form of the content image and the output image match. So you can see the Mona Lisa in all of these. But the textures of the style image and the output image match. So like this has a similar texture to this. And that's kind of like what's happening, why, why these things have a sort of they look the way they do. Um, we said that we can do um, style transfer in real time. So hello, everybody. Let's maybe... <laughs> so do you guys. Everybody say hello. Oh wait, screenshot again. Oh yeah, yeah. Hang on a second. It's a little hard while I'm holding this. Are you guys all in there? I like all the MacBooks. You can see the little... Uh, hang on a second. Oops, sorry. I knew that would happen. Then the last thing is taking the texture from the style and the features from the one you sent. This right here, the Cubist Mirror? The one you sent the last one? Oh, the yeah, yeah. It's the features from the uh, Well, yeah, yeah. It's the features from both, but used in a, in a, in a sort of different way. We'll, we'll explain that more carefully um, in the future. Um, okay, so I didn't talk about these yesterday, or maybe I like briefly said something about them. I'm, we're not going to talk about these today. I just want to give you, this is a hint of some things that we'll talk about later. Because again, this repetition thing. So I'll introduce something so you can kind of think about it later, and then, and then we'll, we'll come back and talk about it. Um, so, uh, because I, I don't want to pigeonhole neural networks right now, because we're talking about them in a very specific way. So they're doing sort of this prediction analysis compression stuff. Um, but they can be set up in all sorts of ways. And a really interesting kind of neural network <clears throat> is what's called an autoencoder. Um, and what autoencoders do is instead of trying to take uh, some input vector and, and you know, classify it or whatever, or predict something about it, what it tries to do is it tries to reconstruct the input. So in other words, the, uh, the, this neural network, its objective is it takes in an input and it goes through the, these transformations, but then what it gets on the other side of it, the output layer is exactly equal to the input layer. So it wants to reconstruct the input. So in other words, this is, as a joke, this is the world's most expensive times one. Right? So the idea is you put in some image or some piece of data. It doesn't have to be an image also. Uh, it can be any kind of data. And it goes through these layers, and then what comes out of the other side is the exact same thing, or something close to it. And that's the way it's evaluated. Like, does it reconstruct the exact same thing? Is that the, the thing where you like look at the camera and then it came up with another guy with another camera? No, not quite. Um, that's that's something a little different. Um, these are this is neural networks that actually produce images, like fake images, um, which which are supposed to be like they the look like the image that went into it. Um, the reason why this is... Sorry? Where you put an image of Google Maps and it gave you a new Google Maps image. 
No, that's also that's that's basically that was basically just style transfer, uh, style transfer with no content. So that's this optimization. We'll we'll look at all those algorithms more carefully. Um, this is, we haven't seen this yet, um, uh, but actually I'll show you an example of what it can do uh, in just a second. Um, so the reason why we do this, uh, or why we might do it, is suppose we set up the network in something like like this, where you have like the input layer has a bunch of pixels. And then it goes through these transformations where it keeps on getting fewer and fewer neurons until you get to this middle layer that has a bottleneck, like a really, really small amount of neurons, let's say just three, right? And then it goes back out. So this, this if you think about what we've learned before, you know, neural networks do these transformations at every layer. And in this case, we're asking the neural network to reproduce the original image, but at a certain point, at a middle layer, all it has is three numbers here. And from these three numbers, it's going to go continue through the network and produce uh, this entire, like uh, the whole original image. So that's really, first of all, that seems very unintuitive that it can do that. Uh, but, but the reason why this is interesting is that we've, what we're effectively doing, because remember like neural networks learn this sort of compositional idea and what we're doing is we're constraining the network to learn a very, very compressed, efficient representation of a data set. And that can be useful for all sorts of ways. So if this is able to reproduce outputs, then these knobs, the, these, or I sh I, I've sort of foreshadowed, these neurons, they become like knobs. They're like these, like, we can play with them a little bit. It's like this generative space, and if we adjust them slightly, it will make adjustments in the thing that it outputs. So if I know that's super, again, super hand wavy, uh, but but we'll we'll look at this. Uh, I'll like we'll see examples of this later. So again, you're not expected to understand exactly what I what I meant because I'm just foreshadowing. We'll we'll talk about these more carefully, depending on how much time we have. Of course, maybe our interests will diverge, but something worth worth understanding. And I'll show you really quickly a couple examples of it. Um, so one person who's really active with autoencoders is, is this guy named Tom White. And um, he works a lot with autoencoders applied on faces. So the idea is you take this huge data set of faces, and there's a couple data sets of faces that you can find. And the autoencoder is then able to produce new faces, faces that like, they look like faces that they came out of the data set, but they're actually like totally fake. And, um, and so what he did this actually of me, <laughs> so, so he put like at my uh, picture, like I think my Twitter profile picture into the input of the neural network and I reconstructed it and I think that's me. That's funny if you don't even know which one is he, because that actually doesn't look like me. I think he made the middle one me. Um, so this one is me. And then if you, you can adjust the generative space so that it creates like, it like morphs faces. So this is me like turning into, I guess, a black woman, <laughs> gradually. Uh, Adjusting the generative space. Yeah, it's, it's a little hard to, to say cohesively, and I, I don't fully understand everything about arm cutters either. Kind of those knobs, yeah. And there's other ways of doing this, uh, not just using autoencoders, but there's another system called Generative Adversarial Networks, which has, is a really cool name, and we'll, I, I did a project with those that I'll, I'll show maybe later in the class. Well, um, so how, did they, how did they start with you, like, you're in the middle versus at the top? Like, how did they start Because it's the parameters that he set on each of these thumbnails. And this one is like just reconstructing my face, and then the other ones are like twisting those knobs a little bit. So again, it finds this... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one is actually. These are none of these are real faces. I mean, like one is one is one of the faces is actually the um, is the reconstruction of a real picture, and then the other ones around it are taking those knobs and kind of twisting them a little bit. So it, it basically creates this like generative model of faces. Mm. So if you guys use processing or open frameworks, you guys might know what Perlin noise is. This is like Perlin noise, but inside of the mind of a neural network. 
So you have these sort of this generative space that you can kind of twist the knobs and it produces new faces, basically. Uh, so are the four corners also based on images of other people? They're, they're, well, they're well, they are in the sense that they were originally trained on the set yeah. of like millions of faces. Uh, but, but they're not, um, but they're not actual reconstructions, like, like at least the middle one is. So this is kind of like a remix. You could technically replay or reproduce the exact piece of music again, but you just adjust the knobs a little bit and add some key lines yeah. to it, and then you get different remixes. Out. Yes, um, that is something that is like the holy grail, I think, of like machine learning and audio, is to be able to like use generative models like this to represent music at the sample level. Like this is at the pixel level, so maybe you can represent it at the sample level and then like make changes to it and produce new versions. That hasn't been done very effectively at all yet uh, because it's, it's a really hard problem. And it's pretty hard for, for images too. You see that they're like, they're sort of weird. I mean, none of these look entirely like faces, right? But he's actually been doing a lot of work on it. And actually, I'll show you some of his recent results. He made a... Um, he made a Twitter account called Smile Vector, which basically takes <laughs> images from that he's he's following these three accounts, and it takes images from them, and it basically adds smiles to them using autoencoders. Uh, <laughs> so, so like this one here's Kanye. He never smiles, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is generative. This is a generative Kanye. Yeah, that that is Kanye, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, some of these are really bizarre looking, I guess. Um, Yeah, well, this is a very niche thing, you know, like, I think it's really awesome. <laughs> this is great, yeah. Let's look at some more of these. This is really funny and, and interesting. Um, mm -hmm. This is just an image you Totally. Yeah. What is that? Yeah, and, and this stuff gets even crazier. So, like, uh, and, and this is not autoencoders, but here, let me show you something um, that reminds me of this. So, there's a, some, like, basically facial puppetry thing going on here. <laughs> here. I'll show you. We present a novel real time facial reenactment method that works with any commodity webcam. Since our method only uses RGB data for both the source and target actor, on? we are able to manipulate YouTube videos in real time. Here, we demonstrate our method in a live setup. On the right, a source actor is captured with a standard webcam. This input drives the animation of the face in the video shown on the monitor to the left. A significant difference to previous methods is the re-rendering of the mouth interior. To this end, we resynthesize the mouth interior of the target actor using video... Let's see, yeah. Did they ever release any of that software, or is it only... Uh, Our system reconstructs and tracks both source and target actors release. using a dense yeah. photometric energy minimization. Using a novel subspace deformation transfer technique, we transfer the expressions from the source to the target actor. Let's see the one. Yeah, this is where he starts doing this to Putin. Wow. <laughs> uh, face to face or whatever. Um, if you look up face to face, real time face capture and reenactment of RGB video, this was in um, this was in last year's um, the main computer vision conference. <laughs> and so yeah, I mean this is like yeah Donald Trump of course. Well, Half is used for evaluation queries. As we can see. Sorry? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it just readjusts it. So 
So yeah, I mean, just to to go back to Marie's point, like we're getting into this like uncanny territory where we can like where we can basically take the visage of a person and and make it seem very real. Um, so that's all something to to be aware of. Um, you know, right now it's kind of like not in this zone where we can really like it's still obvious that it's fake, but I don't know who knows how long that will be the case. Uh, back to the slides. Well, I think, yeah, you can do quite serious about still pop at anybody saying anything. Yeah. Like, yeah, right? Seriously. But is it just face or could you do that with the body and everything? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you could, I potentially, uh, I haven't seen too much of that so yet. you could reenact everything with that person? Not yet. Uh, that's sure. speculative, but yeah, sure. <laughs> so it's a matter of computing power. Completing what? It's a matter of computing power. Well, not entirely. There's other things to it. I mean, there's a lot of mathematical problems that need to be solved. Um, so it's it's not just computing power. It also shows if you move the whole body, then it's going to be like stretching pixels of what's behind the arm before have to change. And All sorts of problems. Move yeah. Move the face that move that same really still. It's just the mass. Yeah. So that's fairly easy to manipulate pixels. Sure. You're like moving your whole arm up. Yeah, it's not stretch all those pixels. Yeah, exactly. The there's yeah, there's lots of lots of <coughs> challenges for sure. Uh, but in any case, yeah, it's something to look out for. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna briefly also introduce recurrent neural networks, and we're gonna like this will be something that we do in probably a future lecture, like spend maybe a whole, you know, because these are these are really interesting also. Um, so all of the neural networks we've seen so far, they're kind of static in the sense that like we train them. And then they have a particular state, which is, which is characterized by its weights. And so when we give it an input vector, it will produce a particular output vector. And if we do it again, it'll do this exact same thing. It'll, it stays static, right? We, we, and we talked about this earlier. So if we send the same image into it multiple times, it will behave the same way, right? Uh, recurrent neural networks are a kind of neural network which basically breaks this assumption and um, it does it in a really interesting way and uh, they're extremely powerful and and um, they've become prominent recently also. Yeah? Sorry. No, I was thinking this is in a way all like that you're going into a new area. No, I, I'm just going to say something like like with autoencoders, like I'm just going to talk about it for a couple minutes and then and so, we're... Okay. This is just because next next time when we introduce them more formally, we'll at least have maybe had time to maybe people will go home and read about these. Who knows? Sure. Um, so it's it's worth just saying. Like I have more slides about this, but we won't. Just short break after this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> no. <laughs> so no. neural. <laughs> we're almost done. We're almost done. Um, so these um, feed forward neural networks are so what all the neural networks we've seen so far are all what we call feed-forward neural networks in the sense that like it takes some input, it propagates through the network, and then information always just goes from left to right, basically, like from one layer to the next and, and then out the outside. Recurrent neural networks allow this the information to travel in loops and stay within the network. So a recurrent neural if this is, uh, if we take everything we've learned about neural networks and encapsulate it into this, you know, input vector, gets multiplied by a bunch of weights and gives us an output, right? It with, with recurrent neural networks, we'll have something like this. Input vector goes in, gets multiplied by a bunch of weights, but the weights themselves are, are actually like, they're being used to, like, uh, well, I'll, I shouldn't say something to confuse you, but, but the, the, think of it this way. There's like a hidden state which is kind of like analogous to weights. So this gets multiplied by these weights and becomes an output vector. But then besides for just doing that, it also goes back in on itself and modifies itself. So, so its hidden state changes with, at every step uh, of time. So like an input goes in and it changes the state. So, sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and oops, uh, and it's, oh, I don't have that, okay. The, the point is that like it's used pr uh, for, for many things, but the main thing that it allows us to do it is it allows us to operate now on sequences of data. 
So not just like a vector of data which has a you know of, which stands for something and then gives us an output, but we can now create sequences of data and make and put them on either on either end. So we can have a sequence be, uh, get turned into some you know output vector or an, uh, an input vector which is by itself gets turned into a sequence or a sequence to a sequence. It basically allows us to take architecture of neural networks to the next level, and um, the uh, one particular use case for uh, recurrent neural networks, which has become super like well known in you know like the AI uh, and art circles, are um, character predictions text sequences. So if you've seen anything like our neural networks which produce text in the style of other text, right? So like like um, have you guys seen anything like um, uh, like generative Shakespeare? or generative um, Bible verses and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's basically recurrent neural networks which take a whole huge amount of text and learn how the text is sort of structured at a character level. And then it can predict characters, sequences, and generate text that looks like it came from some source text. So one example of it, and this, this has become prominent all over, like you'll see lots of articles in the sort of, um, you know, pop science sort of outlets. Uh, whenever someone makes a project with these, um, the, and these, there's a really um, like kind of a, a piece of software that came out last year made by Andre Karpathy called uh, Char RNN, which maybe a few of you have heard of if you were interested in the topic more recently. Um, and what it does is it reads text and then produces text that looks like it came from the source text. So, for example, like you can train it on Shakespeare and then it creates new Shakespeare. So text that sounds like Shakespeare, we'll be looking at all of this and we'll actually be showing how to make these. So um, that might be something that people are interested in doing as a project. We'll be able to like make generative text. And uh, a lot of people have had a lot of fun with this. So like I'll show you just two examples from recent, recently. One was um, this Twitter account called Deep Drump, which is a Donald Trump robot. So it's a chatbot that speaks like Donald Trump. So you can kind of read what it's saying. It's just like, it just sounds like Donald Trump, right? And it's trained on Donald Trump's speeches. So it, like, it gets all these Donald Trump speeches and then it devours them and then it, it, it then understands how to produce text that sounds like Donald Trump wrote it. So right now, think of this. We owe China $1.3 trillion. We owe Japan more than that. We have gun laws. I'll bring back our money. So it's like this, you know, generative Donald Trump. It looks a lot like generative text made by Markov chains. Yes. So how is different Markov chains don't feedback? Or, uh, well, um, so Markov chains are a way, usually Markov chains go at the word level instead mm -hmm. of at the character level. Mm -hmm. And Markov chains are a bit limited because it has very limited short-term memory. So like Markov chains are usually trained, uh, are, are usually like, you know, probabilistic chains of words that go back no more than three or four words. Recurrent neural networks are actually able to, they have sort of a longer memory. So they're able to make context, like contextual sort of choices of, of text that, that seems like it has more purpose because it, 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 it's like, you know, the, in the Markov chain, the beginning of the sentence is forgotten by the end of it. With recurrent neural networks, there's a lot more con context. And when we look at examples of this, you'll, you'll see, and we'll, we'll, we'll save that for a future lecture. Um, also, recently, this was um, someone, and actually a, an ITP student uh, participated in this project named, named um, Ross Goodwin, and they made a, um, a movie, like a short film called Sunspring, uh, which is basically, and this guy's from, um, the, um, what's that show, Silicon Valley? Do you, I don't, do you, has anybody watched that show? Anyway, um, they here, I'll show, I'll show you, like, really briefly. <laughs> Using a recurrent neural network, so they use the recurrent neural network to generate the the um, the the um, script of yeah. this movie. But it could it could have been Markov chains. It's not. It's recurrent neural networks. It's not that different in the results. Uh, with with um, yeah, I mean, I, for in a lot of cases, it's much different. So Markov chains are very simple. Uh, recurrent neural networks are much more powerful. Uh, so here, I'll just like. I saw him again. The way you were sent to me, that was a big, honest idea. 
I am not a bright light. Well, I have to uh, go to the skull. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Ooh. What do you mean? Well, I, I don't know anything about any of this, so... Uh, then what? There's no answer. We're going to see the money. <laughs> it, the script is made by a recurrent novel. All right, you can't tell me that. Yeah, I was coming to that thing, you know, because you're so pretty. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. That's right. So, uh, what are you doing? I don't want to be honest with you. You don't have to be a doctor. I'm not sure. I don't know what you're talking about. I want to see you too. What do you mean? I'm sure you wouldn't even touch me. I don't know what you're talking about. The principle is completely constructed of the same time. <laughs> it's all about you to be true. You didn't even watch the movie with the rest of the base. I don't know. I don't care. I know. It's a consequence. Whatever you need to know about the presence of the story, I'm a little bit of a boy on the floor. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's Sunspring. So this is all in a, in a span of a year. This basically went from... It was trained then on a full script instead of a No, 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 no. It was trained on, like, I think it was trained on a bunch of science fiction uh, stories. This basically, in the span of a year, went from a blog post um, by Andre Karpathy to being, you know, in all of these, like, projects. There's a really good blog post that I, I recommend uh, that you guys read. It, well, once we're getting into RNNs, uh, where this like, Karpathy like trained it on Shakespeare to produce like generative Shakespeare stuff. So like this generative Shakespeare, alas, I think he shall become approached in the day when little strain would be attained into being never fed, and who is but a chain and subjects of his death? I should not sleep. Second senator, they are always this miseries produced upon my soul. So it's like, it, it, it is very similar to a mark of chain in a sense, but where it really starts to shine is when um, is making long-term connections. So for example, all of this is generated by an RNN and, it, and it's able to figure out that like, okay, you have stanzas and, and it says like who, like all of this is done without any supervision. So it doesn't go, okay, give me a character and then the sequence of text. It just does it all by itself. So like, it looks at all these scripts and it figures out, oh, it always says like the person who's saying the line and then it gives them text and it figures that out by itself. Mark of Chains can't really do that. They just, they just forget. Um, and, it, and like, for example, another thing like uh, Wikipedia articles, naturalism and decision for the majority of Arab countries. Capital Lid was grounded by the Irish language. You know, it's just like, it doesn't make too much sense, but you can see that it's like it's beginning to attain some, some consciousness, like forming fragments of things. Can you train it, do you think, on other things that are like language, but, I mean, like something like mathematics, and mathematical formulas get some, or like, even like MIDI sequence. You mean you like, like this? Around. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you read our minds. This math, don't try to re-derive it. <laughs> no, it doesn't make any sense. It's just trained on late, late, like pa math papers. Yeah, none of it makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People have done this stuff on MIDI. It works on anything that sequences. We'll, we'll, we're going to devote more time to this in the future lecture. So, so um, we'll talk about recurrent neural networks later because they're they're super interesting and. And there's a lot to talk about with those, but I just wanted to really briefly introduce them. And we'll, we'll, we should save this for for later. Um, okay, so let's let's go ahead and take a break. And we'll, after the break, like I'll introduce Tisney, and and then I guess after lunch we can try to implement it. Basically. <laughs> so, uh, I read this neural networks and deep learning. Oh, you did? Yeah. It's really cool. And then just I'm, I'm getting through it, and I thought like, oh yeah. And then, oh, 
Like, yeah, they have, they it, have it goes through parts where like sometimes some parts are more complex than other parts, but um, it generally maintains some coherence, I think, so it's pretty good. Um, okay, so everyone's ready to go? So this will be a short segment. I don't think it'll take me too much time to introduce TSNI. It's actually not, not at all as, as hard to understand as neural networks. And then what we'll hopefully do is actually try to learn how to do TSNI a little bit. In, um, and we'll do that in the afternoon, like after lunch, I guess. And um, so let's um, so let's talk about TSNI. Um, TSNI is a technique for dimension. So technically, what it what it is is a technique for dimensionality reduction. Um, and what that means is is um, well, I should let, let me introduce it this way. For our purposes, what TCN is going to be really good for is visualizing data uh, and visualizing it in two or maybe three dimensions uh, spatially in such a way where similar data points are near to each other. And the way TCN accomplishes this is what's called dimensionality reduction, which is a very general technique in, in computer science and data science for uh, reducing the complexity of data but maintaining its sort of overall shape, if that makes any sense. So suppose you have a data set that looks like this. And this is just some random image I pulled from the internet. Like let's say, you, and you know, lots of people have seen spreadsheets of data sets, right? So you have usually your rows of the data are your data points. Um, and the columns of the data sets are attributes or characteristics or variables that describe that data. So I don't even know what this is describing, but you can imagine lots of different cases. So maybe we'll have, we have a database of, of houses, and it tells us all about them, where they're located, and what their price is, and how many floors they have, and all this kind of like di many dimensions of data. This is what we mean by dimensions, like columns, like how many points does our, is, describe our data. So in the case of a raw image, it's the number of pixels. That's our number of dimensions. And it would be nice to represent the data in many fewer dimensions because if we do, there's lots of things that we can do with that. And one of the things we could do is if we are able to represent our data with two data points instead of however many thousands it has, we can then use those two data points to plot it in 2D, uh, to graph it. Um, so I'll show you a few cases of that, like a few applications of TSNI. And TSNI is an algorithm which, which does this. It takes high dimensional data and it finds a what's called an embedding. It finds a two dimensional embedding of the data which preserves the relationships between the data points. So if you have data points that are very similar in many dimensions, they will be very similar in two dimensions as well. So it preserves kind of the distances between them. Um, does that make sense in the sort of yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, so TSNI reduces the dimensionality of data into uh, fewer dimensions. So if you have a data set which is described by many variables, we re we find a two dimensional representation of that data, which preserves the relationships between the points. Okay. So like I'll show you an example of that. Isn't that an in general like yeah, actually, yeah, you sure. I, I think that's that's legitimate. Yeah, so like you have a three D representation of the world, and the and the photo projects it into two D. But what if you have a like a one thousand dimensional projection of the world? Giant <laughs> camera. <laughs> yeah, really giant camera. Like, Yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah, very much. I, I'd say yeah, and that's that's actually like something that people very much I think are interested in. Um, so yeah, like and uh, what is, that's like ambisonics, I guess. That's that's sort of um, what ambisonics is all about. So one application of TSNI is suppose we have a big folder of images, and we want to visualize how those images relate to each other. So this is the result of running a TSNI on a whole bunch of images, and I'll describe this more carefully in a second. But, and did I show this on the first day, right? I showed this briefly. Um, so here's a data set of images of all these animals and plants. 
This comes from a data set called Caltech 256. And you see what's happened is that all of these, all of these pictures, these images, they're data points. And we found a two-dimensional embedding of it that we're looking at, which has preserved the relationships between those points. So similar points are similar in 2D as well. So all of these crabs or whatever, um, scorpions, are all next to each other. And here's the bug section. Let's go to the more, the less buggy part of it. So starfish and tortoises and dinosaurs and uh, jellyfish, jellyfish, unicorns. Here's the unicorn section. Here we've clustered all the unicorns together. Can you believe it? <laughs> you know, you never thought you'd find one unicorn, but now we've been able to find many of them all in one place. So, um, it's a pretty funny data set that it has it has unicorns in it. So, it's <laughs> anyhow, um, whales, ducks, geese, giraffes. Unicorn. I, I guess the unicorns, right? Uh, I think the unicorns are the craziest. Um, at least they're the least real. Um, oh, well, I shouldn't say that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least those images are, are synthesized. So they, they don't. The images themselves are not real. Uh, chimpanzees. Dinosaur. dinosaur. Good point. Yeah, the dinosaurs are not real there. Um, raccoons. So you see what's going on here, right? We're taking high dimensional data, and what I mean by high dimensional is that like the data itself that we have is just pixels, right? Or or maybe something, maybe some representation which is which we're actually going to use a covenant for, but it's still a representation that's very high dimensional. Many numbers describe it. Can we reduce it so that only two numbers describe it, and then we can plot it in two D or maybe three D, like, and then it doesn't make sense to do it past that because we can't visualize four D, right? Um, yeah. Time. Sorry. We time. Yeah, we could add time. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have a question? So just to clarify, T sneeze is, is a process of reducing all the dimensions to two dimensions, but you still will use some sort of like neural network to get usable high dimensional. Yes, uh, that's not required. You can like that. That's that's if we want to. Like a neural network is is gonna is good for this. So I'll show the, in this specific example with images. It's useful to use a neural network first, and I'll show exactly how that works. But TCNE is generic. It just works in any if you have a data set that that you know of housing prices, let's say, or I don't know um, cities or something. Let's say we have a, a list of cities and a bunch of things to describe them. Can we? I, can we cluster the cities together in such a way that similar cities are next to each other? So but the, the, that's already kind of like pre-labeled. Yeah, like if you have a data set that works already, so you could potentially do a TSNI on all of the pixels, and it may work decently. But it might relate things based more like on color. Yes, it may exactly. Yeah, it will. It would relate things more on color, and which is the disadvantage of using pixel raw pixels. And also, it's just there's it's a little too high dimensional in that case. Like it might take forever. Like if your data set has a million dimensions, that might be a little too much for TSNI to swallow uh, because of the process for for actually figuring it out. So so in practice, it's useful to get some intermediate at least for something like images. But if you have a, a data set which already has sort of high level data, you can reduce it to dimensions. Can you use it with sounds as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I will show an example of that. I have that in the slides here. Um, so uh, let me. I'll show three examples of TSNI. One is with images, one is with text, and one is with sound. What is, what is, oh. Sorry, here we go. Um, this is this position that then it sends, like there's something on the dates, something on the Y. Like, they, they don't really mean anything. Um, it's just uh, it's just two, yeah, it's just two dimensions. They, they don't, like, there's no meaning to them. It's just the two-dimensional plotting that preserves the relationships. Like, for example, like you see the the book separated by the others, like which is the reason why it's. Oh, like this one right here, maybe. Yeah. Like that one. I think just because maybe this cluster is more different from the others, you know. So like here's a bunch of zebras. Here's the zebra section. Okay. And maybe it just found it to be more different from the others. But does that mean it's still more similar to 
that other little island next to it than the others? Yes and no. So to some extent. But here's the problem with dimensionality reduction in general. And TSNI is actually not the only dimensionality reduction technique. There's others that are known. Like there's something maybe you've heard of principal component analysis, PCA. Or um, there's, there's others, basically. But TSNI, um, so let me just state that the problem with any dimensionality reduction technique is that because you're reducing the dimensions, it's, in, it's actually impossible to create a perfect embedding uh, in the sense that, like, like you can't, um, it, uh, it's hard to say intuitively why. Like, imagine you're forced to put all of these data points in, in 2D. There's no way that you uh, can do it without having some points where, where actually distant points are, are near to each other because there's not enough dimensions. There's not enough degrees of freedom. And uh, there's too many relationships to preserve to possibly find a good embedding. And so the way TSNI, what TSNI does is TSNI compared to the other ones like PCA and whatever, um, it's not as concerned with making points that are distant from each other be distant in the 2D. It really just wants to get points that are, that are very similar to each other. It wants them to be close to each other. So sometimes you end up with clusters that are actually kind of distant from each other. Like maybe like here zebras are close to whales and they don't really necessarily have very much in common. Uh, but Tisni is less concerned with making them far apart and more concerned with getting all the zebras in one place. Um, and actually maybe the first slide kind of shows that. Like here's a Tisni. So you see that like in, in practice, you'd want the red and the pink and the purple or red, purple, and pink to be right next to each other, right? And here you see like, like this light green is separated from this dark green, right? Because it's impossible really to arrange this in a way that, that would be perfect because there's not enough degrees of freedom. So TSNI is like, TSNI kind of does this, whereas these other dimensionality reduction techniques have this kind of performance. <laughs> um, okay, so the way we would do a TSNI on images is um, what are the data points that describe our images? Well, you could, as we were just talking about, you could use pixels, but it would be much better if we had a better representation of our images to TSNI. And what we do is we take, uh, we use a convolutional neural network. So remember, convolutional neural networks, they take an image and they give us a higher, like, order, a more abstract representation which tells us more about what the content of the image is. Uh, and so in practice, a really good way to do this and the way that this was produced is we took this folder of images and we passed every single image through a convolutional neural network and extracted from it the last layer of activations, the one that the last fully connected layer before the classifications. So remember in the demo, how we, the demo that had the camera, the very last one, the very last slide, the very last part of that before the classification was that sort of signature, that encoding that was in the rectangle, but it was like 4,096 bits. Everyone remembers that, right? Uh, so maybe I should show the demo again. Let me. It, it, it's like the, when we were doing the demo of the convolutional neural network on the webcam, and we went through each layer. It's the last one before the, like when, we, when we're doing the classification, it's the last layer before that. So it's that, it, it was shaped as a rectangle because otherwise it would be too long. And, but it's really just like 4,096 points that describe the content of the image. So what we can do is we can analyze every single image and extract that 4,096 bit vector and that becomes our data point associated with that image. So then we have a, a data set which consists of all of these images and their 4096 bit uh, signature. You can think of it as a signature of sorts, right? It kind of tells you the content of the image. And the content in an abstract way, like each of the points themselves maybe refer to some object or maybe something less interpretable, but the point is it's, it's much more quality information than just pixels. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's like the whole thing is is representative of that sing of that individual image oh, that produced it. Yeah. Oh, 
uh, we were constantly doing it on the webcam. So like every time the webcam got a new image, that, that it would change, right? But every single frame of the webcam, like a single image, gives you a single vector of 4,096 bits, which describes it. How many bits did the original The original image, uh, you know, like, I, I don't remember, I, I guess the webcam is like 320 by 240 or 640 by 480. Um, so it's like, you know, uh, whatever that it, you know, 640 by 480 times three, right, for three color channels. So it's like a million. Um, or, but sometimes you can, you can of course downsample it. You can make it small, right? You could even do it if it was like, you could make the webcam image 100 by 100 and maybe even grayscale it. And then it's only 10,000, which is only twice as big as the, as the, te as the um, encoding. But it's still, the encoding is still better because the information in it is, is not just pixels, it's content. So it's a better, it's, it's, it's more valuable data so that describes it better. Te technically less information, but higher quality. Yes. Less information, but, but higher quality information. Uh, in, in some cases, you could say that's more information because the information carries more value. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so what we do is we take all of these images, we analyze them through a convolutional neural network, we do forward propagation. We put this image into the neural network, pass it through, and then take the 4096-bit vector and extract it. And then we take that and we save it. And we associate it with each image. And then we run TSNI on, all, on that set of, of encodings, and it gives us a two-dimensional embedding. And then we can plot the images according to that two-dimensional embedding. And it looks like this. So, so it's pretty cool. And we can think of like, first of all, it's pretty cool just because it's like, you know, it's nice to look at. But also it's useful. It lets us organize data. You know, if you have a ton of data, it would be really nice if it were like, you know, you probably do this on your desk all the time, right? You like put similar things next to each other. Um, so it's kind of just a useful thing that we can do for, for ourselves when dealing with you know, data that's otherwise really hard to sift through. Um, so that's the case of images. You can do this with text also. So anything that can be represented as a feature vector, and what I mean by feature vector is, you know, a vector, you know, a, a, a set of columns that describe it, you know, a, a data point. Um, so in this case, this is a, and actually let me just go to the actual thing. Um, should we code him? Uh, looks like our oh okay. So this is this is the thing I did with Wikipedia articles. Okay, so check this out. Um, this took it started with I started with this article from Wikipedia, a list of political ideologies. And it has this big list of political ideologies that are grouped, you know, roughly grouped by Wikipedia. And all of these are their own articles, right? And what I do is I took all of these articles and I extracted all the code for this is online also. And we can maybe step through it um, later today. Um, and that might be actually something that might be one of the examples we can try. But basically, you can take these and extract a feature vector for them also. <coughs> and the feature vector that I do for the text is something called... So again, just to see the, this thing in terms of Lego blocks, right? Like, with images, everything, like the TSNI part is always consistent. We're feeding it uh, feature vectors for points. So in, for different kinds of points, we use different kinds of feature extractors. For images, we use a CubeNet, because that's useful. For text, we need something else. So can you get a feature vector from an article? So there's various ways of doing this, and the, the, a really simple way is, 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 um, is co what's called a TF-IDF matrix. Uh, TF-IDF matrix is, is actually, it's a really simple statistic. Um, what it is, is it takes every, so it takes all of these articles, and it takes all of the unique terms that appear in all of the articles. So all of the, you could, those terms can be words. Um, they don't necessarily have to be words. They could be phrases. They could be uh, 
like what are called bigrams or trigrams, so consecutive words. So, but those all become terms. In the simplest case, you just use single words. So all of the words that appear in all of these articles, those become your, the columns of your data. And then for each article, the value that it gets for that word is the frequency of that word within that article divided by the um, frequency of the word appearing in other articles. So in other words, it's proportional. So like the, the, it gets a higher score for that word the more that word appears in that article. And uh, it also gets a higher score if that word does not appear in other articles. So it's like kind of unique to that article or, or it appears more in that article than in others. So it kind of is a measure, TFIDF is a measure of the relative importance of a particular term to a particular article. Um, and this turns out to be a pretty decent way of extracting a feature vector for text. And so two articles that have similar words in them will have similar TFIDF vectors. Is it used by search engines, for instance? Um, yes, I think so. Well, um, yeah, among other things. So sure, yeah, I mean, that, that's very much, you could, that is a good way of, a lot of search engines don't necessarily, uh, well, actually, no, that's, that's not true. Yeah, they do do a lot of content analysis, so that is one way of doing it. There's other, tech, there's other kinds of, TFIDF is a pretty simple one to understand. There's more complicated ones as well, including something that's called like latent Dirichlet allocation and latent semantic analysis. These are like different, they all kind of do similar thing in the sense that like functionally they extract a feature vector which relates bodies of text to each other. Um, and also all of these approaches, they are what's called a bag of words. Um, so in the sense that like it, it basically discards order of words. It's just like it assumes that articles that have similar words next to each other may be similar. So and, and that's why for example like um, like um, for in, in this case the um, the anti-feminism article and the masculism article appear right next to each other because they're probably both talking about the same thing. But it, um, oh, I, I suppose they are similar. I was, I was trying to think of like an example where maybe two articles may be different in the sense they have completely different viewpoints, but they're talking about the same thing. And so they'd be grouped together because they have the same words appearing. Still oh, that's, that's a good point, yeah, <laughs> anti-feminism is. Next to feminism, yeah, um, yes, of course. Uh, but um, but in any case, so that's that's like a way of doing this with text. So you extract the a feature vector for each text article, um, which which is the vector of all the words and their importance to that article, and then you apply TSNI to it to get that in two D, and then you can take all the articles and graph them in two D. So we can look at this, and, by, and these are all links too, so like we can click on them. This is a nice way of browsing Wikipedia, I suppose. So you go to Christian Feminism. Right, so like, uh, and we can go like, we can see other parts. So there's like, here's a Marxist cluster right here. Totalita totalitarianism and intellectualism. That's an interesting one. Um, Anti-Stalinist left, revolutionary socialism, Titoism, Bolivarianism, Stalinism. Let's go down here. Green. So totalitarian Sure. And intellectualism. Mm -hmm. They both use words mm -hmm. a lot that are not used in other places. P potentially, yeah. Or like this cluster of articles tends to have certain kinds of words appearing more in them than, than other articles around here. So they have a, you know, like related words kind of thing. So I was just thinking of doing this and if you did this dilute totalitarianism on the occasion, dilute itself, like show people which Wikipedia articles are similar, but you know, they're similar or speaking in similar ways about things, or similar. Yeah. And I thought that's what you were doing, basically. Mm -hmm. I bet, I'm not sure, can you, what do you mean? Remove the article, totalitarianism article? Let's say the way we talk about um, furry culture and the way we talk about um, juice cars mm -hmm. use the same language. We don't think of those as similar things, mm -hmm. but the language that we use is similar. Would they appear next to each other on here? 
I think in the way you described it, yeah, I, I would say they would. If, if the articles uh, tend to use the same words, then yes, they, would, they should appear next, close to each other. Um, remember that TSNI is not guaranteed to get an optimal embedding because it's impossible. So sometimes there are actually two words which, are, which um, actually do have very different feature vectors but appear in TSNI to be close to each other because it's impossible geometrically. We don't have enough spatial dimensions to, to embed it in 2D in such a way that that doesn't happen. So in some cases, like, there might be, there are, you know, like, there are some that don't make sense here. Yeah. Yes, you could do, you could do, you could do TSNI in any amount of directions, uh, but, but TSNI is really, is potential, is particular, is um, uh, primarily used for visualization, and so it doesn't, so usually you'll see it in 2 or 3D. And if, if you wanted to incorporate time, you could do a 4D TSNI and then use one of them as in time. I haven't seen anyone really do that, um, but Very confusing. yeah. <laughs> is TF IDF? Is that a uh, No, um, it's just uh, like a, an algorithm that that give that counts words and then creates a feature vector. Mm -hmm. It stands for term frequency inverse document frequency. You, you can look it up on Wikipedia. The, the formula for it is, is like, it's like I said, it's just a statistic. Count the number of words uh, and then divide it by actually the logarithm of the number of articles that that word appears in. And that denotes the, the importance of that word to that article. If you use a compnet for it, would it be more accurate? How would you use a compnet for it? It's not like doing like for it. Last well, we're not generating anything. We're um, there. Is, there is some like <coughs> like people have used like sort of one D T one D comments on text. I'm not super familiar exactly how that works, but potentially you could do some analysis with a comment. Um Actually, I think no people. I think there is some. That is a way that like that's not what this is doing. But you could potentially analyze text with a comment which sounds weird because we've been seeing them as images, but you could represent um, characters as, as pixels in some sense. Um, I'm not exactly familiar with the mechanics. I haven't looked at it, but, but it's in theory kind of possible. Um, but this is, a, this is actually a pretty simple one. You see it does a decent job. Um, the, the downside is that like uh, it doesn't take into account that words, there are similar words, so if like one article uses the word totalitarianism a lot, but another article uses the word Stalinism a lot, um, it doesn't necessarily associate those two uh, because, you know, it, it'll just count them separately. They'll be separate columns. And so it doesn't take into account, you know, um, synonyms and things like that. There is um, an approach that tries to actually get around this, which is more complicated, called latent semantic analysis which actually does take into account similarity of words and is potentially better, but, um, but usually for, for this kind of application, it doesn't make much of a difference. Um, so yeah, this is, this is kind of neat. You know, there's a bunch of, if, you know, you can, you can look at it at some point. Um, but in any case, um, so that's, that's TCN on text. So then the last one is TCN on audio. So I have a sample library um, a few of you guys saw this yesterday. I showed it at um, um, at uh, the Sonic Code sessions at Spectrum. Um, so I took I have a sample library of drum samples, like one second clips, and I arrange them using TSNI. Uh, let me here here they are. So every time my mouse goes over a sample, it plays it. cluster. Yeah, it's just a sample set. Um.
so this kind of thing. Um, is that online? Sorry? Is that online? The, uh, it's not online. There's an open frameworks application, so, but uh, the code is, will be online shortly. I just have to clean it up. But all of the, all three of the things that, I, that, that we looked at, I'll be providing you with tools to make your own. Um, so like you can, you can uh, all of these tools will be available and you can think of them you know, creatively. Potentially you could do text that's not articles, but maybe other kinds of text. Um, and lots of people have played around with Tisney. Um, actually, Kyle, Kyle McDonald did a really neat thing with um, like um, uh, Hindu ragas. Uh, let me find this if I can. Uh, let's see if I can. I think it's here. Oh, this is just the. This might be it. Is this it? No, this isn't what I saw. I have to. I have to look locate this. All right, I'll just describe it for you. Um, Kyle did this. Uh, he had a database of ragas. So uh, these are like um, like um, in 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 Hindi music. This is like. Classical Indian music, there's, uh, ragas are like basically these scales. Um, they're a little hard for me to describe. I won't, I won't try to put you in. Uh, <laughs> um, sorry? She said that's fine. Okay, well, um, the point is that like uh, all of them differ. <laughs> there's many, many of them. There's like hundreds, thousands, right? And they differ from each other in, in, um, in basically the kinds of notes that appear, the kind of notes that are allowed, the motifs that, are, that, that uh, characterize them. And they can be sort of quantified. You can get a feature vector that describes, that describes them. And then he used the TSNI to visualize them. So different, similar ragas that were related to each other would appear next to each other. And he had a, he had a big image of it. I'll find it for you guys uh, later. It's, it's pretty, pretty cool. So like the point is you can do it on any kind of data. So you know, like if you have cities or something and you have a data set that describes cities and various characteristics of them, or a data set that describes I mean, I'm sure you guys can think of lots of ideas. You know, anything that can you can describe in numbers, can you can apply TSNI to um, to a big data set of them. Um, maybe it's uh, I think it's on Flickr. Um, so we're gonna do this. Uh, oh, is this it? Oh, I think this is it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, exactly. We want to look at this today. So these are, and Kyle also has this like um, coloring technique that he uses, where he does the TSNI in three D, and then takes and then and then associates those three Ds with colors. And actually, it's a good visualization for how, um, like, um, sometimes the embedding is not optimal because things that are so, for example, like the pink section is separated from the orange section, maybe they should actually be closer to each other, but you can't find the perfect embedding. So um, so this is what it looks like. So this is kind of a neat thing. So the point is, yeah, anything you can represent as a, um, you know, as a feature vector can be visualized with TSNI. Oh, no, I guess I'm just wondering, does anyone do it? Uh, you know, like the online, the, the spectrum of colors and the that they're actually different yeah yeah so this is kind of like like this shows how and and I mentioned how like TCE, because the whole nature of dimensionality reduction is that you're reducing the number of possible ways that the data can be organized and since the data and, and, and so you have so many data points it's impossible to arrange them geometrically in such a way that preserve that that actually does preserve all the point distances so here you can see right here that this little cluster right here is kind of orange it got separated from everyone everywhere else because because for two reasons one is that TSNI is not perfect it won't find the optimal solution but also because the optimal solution isn't possible to to embed because there's not enough spatial dimensions to organize the data it's like it's like if you have uh, it's like a geometry problem. Let's say you have eight points in 3D, 
Is it possible to arrange all eight points in such a way that every two, every pair of them has the same distance? It's actually impossible. It's a, it's a problem in geometry. There's no possible embedding of those eight points in 3D such that the distance between every pair of points is identical. Um, so it's, so that's kind of one of these, and it, it's related to that same idea. And for sounds using a cognac? Oh yeah, I should mention how I made the sound. So the sound, so again, just to, just to, in the most general sense, we're extracting a feature vector from the audio. And in this case, the feature vector that I used, it takes, uh, it works, at least what I did, it works best with very short samples. Um, audio feature extraction is, can be tricky um, because you know samples of data carry very little information. They're like pixels, uh, but the feature vector that it's using here are they're taken from from like audio signal processing, and it's um, a one second long frame, and it extracts the. I think I'm using MFCCs. I forgot what I. I think I used MFCCs. Um, MFCCs is a. Um, don't worry about that. That's very that's very specific to the audio domain. Like we can, we'll talk about feature extraction and stuff. But MFCCs is something that a lot of uh, people who work with digital audio use. It's a kind of um, it's like a spectrogram, but but it's related to sort of perceptually relevant uh, frequencies that 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 are experimentally derived. So it's like the presence of particular frequencies in audio that are um, perceptually meaningful. And it takes the average of the MFCCs over that one second frame and the variance of them. So it captures both the, the sort of average and also how much they're changing. And there's other more complicated techniques in audio analysis that we can look at. Um, potentially it could be done even straight from the raw audio, like the samples. Uh, but that's, that's a little hard and I think the best cases I've seen of this so far use some feature extraction. Um, I used to do a lot of audio stuff in the, in the sort of when I was first getting started with with machine learning, so that's something that I could maybe assist a lot with um, for those who are interested in doing it with audio. Um, but um, yeah, this, this is a fun way to think about organizing music, and and um, not, it doesn't necessarily have to organize. It doesn't necessarily have to organize sound according to perceptual uh, or according to how it sounds, right? You could maybe think about organizing music, like songs of music, based on their similarities. One similarity that you can uh, associate with music is like who's listening to it. That's a feature vector, right? So if, if some pieces of music have similar listeners, at which you can find, there's data for that, um, you, can base, you can maybe cluster music, like songs that have the same fan bases or bands that have the same fan bases, things like that. And people are doing those kinds of visualizations, which are pretty neat. That would be cool, actually, if you could use like, a lot of ways to Tinder, so like you use... Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but like using Tinder and then you can kind of visualize the music style or the music interests of all the people and then kind of like date people based on... <laughs> 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 Actually, I had a I had a thought about about Tinder the other day, which is that they have so I guess like with with Tinder that you know it's just like they, you see people's faces and then and then you uh, and then you swipe or right and um, so they must have a billion billions of these right because people just flip through them right all the time and so you can you they can probably do if they wanted to they could probably predict uh, which way you're going to swipe with a very very high confidence. Because this is like basically covenant to covenant, and a billion points in their training set. It's probably scary how predictable, how predictable you, you all are. <laughs> and we are, yeah. Oh really? It's like really like people are just kind of like racist. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Like, and, and even and probably in even more subtle ways. Like we're super predictable. Yeah. Like even it could probably figure out like all yeah. And just from the image too, like like you could use a covenant to analyze people's faces, and then and then basically go map from covenant to covenant. You have one face that's that's um, they could probably play matchmaker and probably do it really well, and maybe they already do. Who knows, right? Like <laughs> there is a guy a few years ago that did a prototype of um, um, kind of automatized selection on the. Um, Machine network. Uh, I don't know if it was maybe not Tinder at the time. Yeah. But, uh, on this kind of uh, network, he did 
he was a Silicon Valley developer and he did his own uh, software to sort uh, the matching faces based on oh, yeah. the faces that he used to like. Uh -huh. And he did all the job for him. It was kind of a proof of concept. I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know that particular. I know. I know there was a, a project from maybe like maybe five ten years ago that Luke Dubois did. Um, if you guys know who Luke Dubois is, he he did this thing where he made like like sev like several dozen dating site profiles and then scraped all of the all of the profiles of people and then extracted like where they're from and all this stuff and then he was able to do this visualization of America based on what words people put um, into their profiles more. So like, I, um, I forget what it was called, but like one, some of the results was like, what, what words do people in some locations use more than others? And so in New York, the, the biggest word was now. Like now is like something that people in dating profiles in New York use a lot. And then like in California, it's like surfing or something. I don't know. <laughs> What's that? Which one? I think it's looking for like non like you know specific like, no, words. Like, you know, like when you're writing, like oh. <laughs> um, just, so, just, yeah. just a short comment. There's a book called Data Clism. I think it's written by some of the guys behind OkCupid uh, dating site, and they actually release a lot of statistics about when they do T T F I D F things on people's profiles and stuff. Yeah. And then they also do some of the most Antithetical words, so the words that kind of, uh, for some, they, they do a lot of stuff with race, it's a bit controversial, but for instance, black men, which uh, terms don't they use ever in their uh, oh, profiles yeah. compared to all the others? Sure, for yeah. instance, Bella and Sebastian, they don't write that, whereas all the other groups sometimes kind of write. Bella yeah, and yeah, yeah, right. Really <laughs> kind of and the same with like white men don't say that they're raised in New York City. That, that reminds me, actually, this just was the other day. Um, someone did an analysis using like uh, natural language processing for, uh, and was extracting from, from um, lyrics what the most metal uh, words are. So like heavy metal, like the genre, like the most, what are the most metal words and the least metal words? This is really funny. Uh, okay, so the most, the most metal words, this is extracted from natural language processing. Burn, cries, veins, eternity, breathe, beast, gonna, demons, ashes, soul, sorrow, sword, goodbye, dreams, gods, pray, rain, tear, flame, scream. And then I love this. The it's even funnier is the least metal words, particularly <laughs> <laughs> indicated secretary committee. <laughs> <laughs> Approximately. <laughs> I mean, you can understand, like in metal, apparently, apparently, heavy metal bands don't use the lyric particularly. Uh, particularly. <laughs> so yeah, this is this is really funny. This was just from a few days ago. Um, it's also that they love vocabulary hip hop. Oh yeah, you could do this with hip hop, probably too. Yeah. Um, they like go through all the hip hop acts and see who's got the highest uh, vocab. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, that's really cool. And uh, I forget who had the highest, like, yeah, like, um, vocabulary. Um, what was it like? Oh, ASAP Rock had the highest vocabulary. This sort of, this sort of a couple of years ago, I guess. Uh, well, oh, was it? Oh, this one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, so the highest is over here. ASAP Rock, GZA, Cool Keith, Cannabis. And then the lowest one is DMX, right? Because he just, he just barks, right? <laughs> yeah, unique words. Yeah, so that's pretty, that's pretty cool. I like that. Anyhow, um... So that's that's basically T Sne. Oh, this is this is just for fun. So I'll show you this. So here's a here's a little experiment you can do. So T the way T Sne is solved, we haven't talked about T how it's solved. It's also like it's basically solved in almost the same way that neural networks are, neural networks are solved. It's it has this optimization function, 
It's trying to maximize the interpoint similarity or, the, or minimize the distance between similar points. And it does so using this process, which I mentioned a couple of times, the castic gradient descent, um, which means like it analyzes, it has, it fi first starts randomly. It'll distribute the points randomly. And then it will, it will evaluate how good it is. And then it will use calculus to figure out how to move the points slightly so to make it better. And it will do that repeatedly. And um, so one little experiment that you could do is to um, make a data set of colors. So just a three-dimensional data set where all of, the, all of the points are random and you can visualize them with color, right? So like if you have a three-dimensional data set and you associate each one with a color, you can, you can color them that way and visualize it. And so this is a T-SNE converging three-dimensional points, which we're visualizing with color, into 2D, right? So this is colors being, colors being t sneed And this is how it looks if you visualize it at every iteration. It's, it's really cool. It's really wild, right? <laughs> it kind of finds like a sweet spot. And then it just like, at the end, it just, there's a reveal. Just like, <laughs> yeah. So that's a neat little experiment that you can do. Um, this, this is made with open framework, so, it's, so you can, you can re-implement it. Um, another thing you can do, and I'll just mention this briefly, so we were looking at, um, uh, T-SNE gives you this like two-dimensional embedding, right? Um, sometimes what's really cool to do is like if maybe you want to put it into a grid. Um, so like a grid in either 2D or 3D uh, just to organize it. So these are, algor there are algorithms that, that take an unordered distribution of 2D points and then finds a grid embedding. So an organized grid, which tries to also preserve those interpoint distances. And uh, there's two really nice implementations that we can use both of them. One is in open frameworks, and that's made by Kyle, um, which is the one that mine is bundled with, the one I made OFX TSNE. So I'll show you guys this in open frameworks later. Um, but you can do these grid embeddings also in open frameworks. And then in Python, there's one made by Mario Klingemann called raster fairy and these and they're both doing essentially the same thing they take a two-dimensional it doesn't it's not just for tsne it's just if you have a collection of points in 2d that you want to grid this does it in the most effective way basically um, and then so what you can then do is instead of instead of the unordered tsne of animals you could do a gridded tsne of animals so now they're like here's all the whales geese giraffes ostriches Chimpanzees, owls, ducks, bears. You get the idea, right? Um, actually, I made a, I basically, and I'll show you guys this later. Uh, I'll show you this later this afternoon. I have a script in Open Frameworks that, that does exactly this on any set of data. Or, or sorry, on any set of uh, pictures. So it's, it's like ready-made, out of the box. So if you, and we were going to just do this. So like if you have a collection of photos that you want to grid, or just an unordered TSNE. Um, we can do that with open frameworks, um, and, um, and that's what produced these. And I released a tool online that lots of people started using. So like I got a few people contributing. I'll show you a few of them. So like um, a student of Golan Levins at Carnegie Mellon named Amant Tiwari took um, the entire catalog of IKEA. There's all these images and visualized IKEA's catalog. Which, in my view, this should be what IKEA's website looks like, right? This kind of thing, right? Um, this is made by an artist named Olivia Jack. These are street views. These are Google street views. So you analyze, analyze with a covenant um, from Bogota, which I guess is where she lives. Um, this is made by Morch, Morch Steffner, who, has he been here? He lives in Germany. Um, but anyway, he he's, uh, does a lot of data visualization, and he, he has a database of, of Impressionist paintings. So would they manually construct these data sets, or did they have a sort of script or something standard? Um, I think 
Moritz had a database that was given to him by, by someone. I mean, these have to be manually compiled somehow. Um, so yeah, so a lot of times like the data that we really want is just not available. So I have so many, if I could get a huge data set, if anyone can find like a huge data set of paintings, um, I have some ideas for data visualizations that I'd love to do, but it's just really hard to find. Um, those things are not necessarily made super available. Um, but the IK can probably add a script. Yeah, I think for that one, yeah, you could, you could, I think you could just scrape them. I think it was probably just scrape. Uh, so scrape, when I say scrape, I mean like someone just, you can, you can make a program that looks at the HTML and finds all the image tags and then just downloads them. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, totally. And that, that does exist. Uh, so like the, when I did the Wikipedia project, I'm using, there's actually a Python library called Wikipedia, which is just extracts text really well. And I think it, you can use it to get images too. So yeah, I haven't really trolled so much like Wikipedia and I, I'm curious to see what image sets they have. I haven't looked into it. Are they, and they're organized somehow or? Yeah, they have, um, I was just looking at it today. Mm -hmm. It's just Wikimedia. Wikimedia Commons? Yeah. I see, yeah. Images by. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you need something to crawl through it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there's already a library that basically does that. Um, but but I'm curious how big the sets are. So like they may only be, okay. So it's super nested. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Yeah. You know, actually, and Mario Klingemann does a lot of this kind of stuff too. He collects tons of images, and then does all these like sorting techniques. But this might be cool. I was hoping to try to find like all of let's say Picasso's paintings or something. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's hard. It seems like not easy to find. But yeah, this is worth looking into. This could be, there could be lots of data out there. There's so much data out there. It's just, and a lot of times it's kind of unstructured and so it's hard to obtain, but it's definitely something super useful, worth, worth looking into. I'll just show like one or two more of these. So Zach Lieberman, who made Open Frameworks. So, and these are satellite images. And this, this might remind you a little bit of Terra Pattern, right? So we looked at Terra Pattern the other day, also doing this sort of like organizing satellite imagery. And this is another way of doing it. So similar satellite images appear near to each other. And this one is like grocery store items made by Blair Neal. <laughs> these actually, he told me, these were collected by hand. Like they took 10,000 pictures of, 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 of uh, grocery store items. Yeah. Uh, okay, and then the the last yeah I, I've already kind of this is this is a really big one the idea of Caltech, two fifty six and there's like a cluster of unicorns here also. Where is it? Where's my unicorn cluster? Oh, I can't zoom in anymore. Yeah, you can kind of see them. They're like in the center there. <laughs> Close to Jesus and Buddha. Close to Jesus, Buddha, and Superman. There's a Superman cluster here. So yeah, that's, that's that one. Okay, so yeah, I was gonna, okay, so this is the last thing, but I think maybe we can do this after lunch. Um, yeah, should, should we? So one of the other things, so let me just describe like what, what else we are gonna do today. Um, I guess it may be a good time to, to break, but I was thinking like, we'll do some practical TCN stuff this afternoon, maybe install some software and show how to make those. And then, um, Another two things that I could propose are like we can have a little discussion about the trolley problem, which is a good lead-in to some of the 
more ethical stuff that we want to talk about. Um, the nice thing about trolley problem is that it's not necessarily machine learning specific. It's just like a kind of like ethical dilemma, which is apple, apple, which is really relevant to machine learning. And then we can, we'll, as we go through the course, we'll d bring in more ethical issues, which are maybe more specific to machine learning. Um, and so, and then, yeah, and some practical TCD stuff. So, um, what do you think, like, should we, should we break now? Yeah, 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 actually, yeah. Okay. So let's break now. Um, and, um, yeah, we'll come back and do those things. Yeah, some, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. This is a quick addendum to earlier today. I just wanted to include um, a really quick tutorial on how to use the image TSNI software. We, we did this earlier today, but um, we spent a bunch of time debugging, so I thought it would be useful to kind of make a single uh, tutorial uh, taking you through it and it's now on github so you can find it at this link and clone it um, and set up um, a few of the, of the dependencies so you can get all the dependencies in this file cnn tsne these are all the ones that you need and the main ones are um, numpy which you which you should have by now um, pillow so you need to um, install pillow which you can do just uh, with pip install pillow um, installing Keras is um, also a few commands. You can look that up in the Keras documentation. And then um, scikit-learn. And um, so we're going to go ahead and, and I'm just going to take you through the code really quickly. So the way we do this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a terminal open. Um, I'm already inside the image tsne folder. So if you ls to see what we have, you'll see the following files, cnn tsne. Um, dot pi, which is kind of the, the main code base, and we're, but we're really going to uh, kind of use code from main.py. And um, I already have that open also. Oh, I don't actually. Uh, let's open that. Um, I use um, TextMate as a text editor. You can also use whatever text editor you want, if you have Sublime or whatever. Um, and I'm just going to, this is kind of not the most elegant way to go through Python code, but I'm just going to kind of copy and paste code from the main file into the terminal because it'll demonstrate things kind of one at a time. Um, eventually I'll kind of maybe make an IPython notebook or something like that. Um, so the main thing is uh, what you need to do first is make sure that everything in the CNN tsne compiles and we just do this import. Make sure you're in the folder image tsne when you go into Python because it's it's looking for this file CNN tsne which is right here. So we go from CNN tsne import everything. It's going to um, grab Keras, which for us is using Theano as its backend, um, and tsne, and numpy, um, and h5py, which you also need to install, of course. Um, I didn't mention that. So um, I'm just going to go through line by line. We're going to set the image width and height to be 224. This is required because the, the neural network we're setting up has that as its input layer. So it's going to be 224 by 224. We have this downloaded um, VGG weights. So I'm going to set that. That means that when whenever we load an image to pass through the network, we're going to resize it to 224. Um, this should be the path to where you have the VGG 16 weights file. If you don't have that, you can download it. Uh, there's a link here, right here, where it says download weights here. Um, go into this file and download um, the VGG weights. What those are is it's the, the weights of a trained neural network, um, a convolutional neural network, which we're going to set up and use to do our um, analysis of the images. And then, um, so I'm just going to set that. And then images path, again, this is going to be something that you need to set for yourself. Um, where, whatever folder you have of images that you want to do a TSNI of, um, I just have this kind of random set of animals <clears throat> a set of images of animals that I have in this location, but set this to whatever folder that you want to analyze. Um, so I'll go ahead and do that. And then tsne path is where we're going to save the, um, the, the analysis, like the tsne points when we're done with them. And you can leave this alone because what it's actually doing is it's going into, um, uh, it's going into this sketch right here. There's a processing sketch that I made to quickly visualize the images. Um, and then the, the final tsne points text file will go here when you're done with it. And um, 
but you can put it somewhere else if you want. You don't have to use processing to visualize it if you don't want. <clears throat> um, so, so I'll set that again, um, back to Python. And uh, this variable, um, basically if you have lots and lots of images, like let's say a couple hundred or a couple thousand even, it may take a really long time to do, do the analysis. And if you're kind of in a hurry, you can, you can make this skip variable more. What it does is, you know, if you have like a thousand images, and you set the skip to be five, then it'll do image one, image six, image 11, image 16, and so on. So it just kind of skips through your folder of images. Um, I'm just gonna, by default, I'll just use the default, which is one, which means do every image in your folder. Um, the next thing we, we need to do is to load the model. So I'm gonna load the model, and it's this, this um, function from CNN TSNI. If you wanna look at it, you can open that file. And actually, maybe we'll go ahead and do that just so we can really quickly um, understand what it is that's happening. So here, the the the, the uh, function that I called is this VGG sixteen. This um, sets up a convolutional neural network with the following architecture, and this is this is kind of very typical for Keras. We create um, the network and then add these layers, which has basically interspersing convolution and pooling layers. Um, the padding thing we didn't really talk about today, but padding is something that you do often in convolutional layers to create, um, to, to kind of pad the image with zeros at the border so it kind of stays a consistent size. Um, we'll talk about this a little more carefully in the following days, but if you want to know more about that, just look up padding, um, just Google search padding in, in convolutional neural networks. So I'll get back to the code here. Um, and we loaded the model, and now we're going to take this the, the path that refers to the VGG weights, and then we're going to run this function called load weights, which and what, what that will do is it will load this huge file, which contains all of the weights of the trained network, and this might take a few moments. Uh, what it's doing is it's loading those weights and then putting them into the network. They're setting all the weights, which are otherwise random, um, to be the network. So now we have this trained network. Um, and then just run this um, compilation, these compilation lines. And actually, I'm not sure that SGD is necessary because we're not actually using the stochastic gradient descent. Maybe you can actually, let's see if this works. No, uh, okay. Go back to SGD, do that. Um, okay, so we have a compiled model. Um, and now we're going to grab our list of images. This line right here will just go into the images path. This is where your the folder of images that you contain, and it will grab all those images. So now I have this big vector of images. You can see zebra zero seven three. Um, this contains. This is all the names of the the images that we're going to do our analysis on. And then um, if you skip as one, you don't actually need to do this because it, it will just keep it the same. But if you do want to take a subset of this list using the skip variable, um, you then run this. And you can run it either way. Um, finally, this loop is now going to uh, do the analysis. And I'm just going to start it now and describe what's happening. So now it's going through each of the images and it grabs its file path and then it loads the image at this at the width and height that we specified 224 by 224 and then it will um, it will pre it's a predict will do a forward pass of the image through the neural network and it will grab the last layer activations the the actual model that we made is missing the classification layer you can see that that's not included so the last layer here is the last fully connected layer. So it has 4,096 numbers, and it corresponds to this high um, dimensional you know, abstract vector containing um, the content describing this image um, in some sense. So what, what we're grabbing that as our representation, and we're going to use that as our data source for TSNI. Um, and then we're appending it to this big array of activations this is gonna take a while, and actually this is probably too many, so I'm just gonna stop it. Um, I'm gonna stop it and make the skip much higher. Let's make it like every five or something. So now this will do just one fifth of the activations. 
Um, so let's let's grab these images now at the following skip. So now we have many less images. Um, right, so there's 1370 images now. That's one fifth of the original number of images. And now we're gonna we're gonna run these through the CubNet. Um, 1370 is a pretty good amount for testing. That's a lot of images to visualize at once. Um, you can try different amounts. You can try a really small amount. Um, it works best in sort of you know the hundreds or or maybe in the thousands if you're using small images. Um, whatever you like, basically. Um, okay, so while this is um, analyzing, I'm just going to pause it here and I'll come back to this when it's done. It'll take, you know, at this rate, it'll probably take, you know, a few minutes or a half hour or something um, to finish. And then, so I'll be back in just a moment. Uh, okay, we're back. Um, so all the activations are done. There's 1370 of them. So now we're going to go ahead and we're going to turn that into an array. So this will just make this into a NumPy array. And then we're going to run that through tSNE. And it's going to have two components. That means we're tSNEing into two dimensions. And there's a, um, there's a um, parameter in tSNE called perplexity, which um, roughly means like how many kind of um, clusters it's, it's sort of looking for. This parameter is mostly um, pretty robust, so you can kind of set it higher or lower. Um, it doesn't make too much of a difference, so for, for most of the time, you can experiment with this if you'd like, but um, for the most part, you can kind of leave it at, at like a, a median, which is like 30, unless you um, have some idea of the, of the sort of distribution of your data set. And so you'll run this line, and it will generate the tSNE. And this will just take a, a moment. Um, tSNE is, a, is an iterative algorithm, so it kind of proceeds in iterations, adjusting the two-dimensional points um, through each iteration. And by default, it will finish after um, at most 1,000. Although I guess, yeah, after it, it, if it starts to converge very quickly, it'll just stop. And so here it's kind of done after 200. So now tSNE is done and we can see that we have it and it looks like this. tSNE um, <clears throat> has 1370 rows, that's for each of our points, and two columns. So now these points correspond to our, um, our tSNE points. And uh, initially they're like unnormalized, so they appear sort of all, all over the place. And what I like to do is actually quickly normalize them. So this block of code right here will create a normalized x vector. So everything is between zero and one now, all the x values and all the y values are also between zero and one. And now this block of code right here will save it to save the results to this tSNE path. And, um, and so let's just go ahead and run that. And then this will close the file and say, hooray, we're done. Great. Um, so let's go ahead and look at what that produced. If we go into the, it saved it into this data folder. So now we see this new tSNE points. And what it has is it just has the address of the file, of each image, and the, the tSNE points. And actually, um, I should mention a few things about this. This thing will get screwed up if um, you have spaces in your, <laughs> it'll get screwed up if you have spaces in your address because of the way I set it up. This would be much better done in like XML or JSON or something, but I haven't done that. So the way I have it um, kind of pull apart the data in processing is by looking for spaces. And so if you have a space in the address bar, it'll, it'll screw it up. So <laughs> um, so go ahead and um, yeah, so you can, you can use this now. Um, and uh, I have a processing sketch that will quickly visualize it so we can open that. That's CNN TSNE viz. And all it does is it just loads that, that point, and then it um, will display all the images. So let, let's just go ahead and run it, and you'll see in the, while it's doing this, you see that it's loading all the images, so it kind of goes through them quickly. And the way, this is a really simple sketch, it just resizes all the images to 100 by 100, even if they're not square, um, just because I just wanted to do this really quickly, so to demonstrate it, but if you want to, um, do something a little more elegant, then you may want to kind of modify this code. So now you see the display here. All of our tSNEs are um, scattered. Uh, our tSNE has scattered all these images in a 2D grid where similar images are kind of clustered together. 
So you see that there's like this cluster of tomatoes here and a cluster of um, like scorpions and bugs, um, bears and chimpanzees and ostriches and so on. Um, so this is kind of what TSNI is doing. It's producing uh, an embedding in 2D in which the interpoint distances are sort of preserved. And, um, and so it's, an, it's kind of a nice way of visualizing data. Um, otherwise, you can, you can load this TSNI points file however you like and maybe find other ways of expressing the data. Um, so that's basically all. Um, there will be some notes included with this, um, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about TSNI um, in the future weeks and, and kind of try to incorporate it more into the tools that we're using. We'll also maybe try to do an audio TSNI and a text TSNI. These are other sample examples that I've um, created in the last few few weeks and few months. Um, so we can kind of, um, depending on what people are interested in, we can we can we can try all of those. Um, okay.